guest, the Honourable Premier. Oh, well, thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and welcome back to my colleagues for another day of debate in our provincial legislature. Uh, welcome to those who have joined us in the public gallery uh, and those who have joined us in the speaker's gallery, I think. Uh, uh, it's great to see a good crowd here and kind of like the new caucus we have, there's, we're bulging at the seams over there, so <laughs> it's great, uh, good problems to have. Uh, I just wanted to begin uh, in recognition this, this afternoon that in a military parade in Charlottetown uh, last evening that Lieutenant Commander Michelle Hopping was named as the commander of HMCS Queen Charlotte, uh, taking over command from Lieutenant uh, Commander uh, John McDonald, and with uh, Lieutenant Commander Hopping uh, is the first woman to be uh, the commander in the 100 year history of the HMCS Queen Charlotte. So I wanted to congratulate uh, Lieutenant uh, C Commander Hopping with that uh, uh, great privilege, and I know she'll do a wonderful job uh, in her leadership role. Um, I also wanted to say something that's near and dear to your heart, uh, Madam Speaker, as well as many in this legislature, that the PEI harness racing season has kicked into full gear with uh, racing uh, right now at uh, Red Shores in Charlottetown and soon to be Summerside. Uh, and it's, uh, it's great to see that wonderful uh, uh, right of spring uh, uh, in full, uh, full, on full display. And I know, uh, as you do, that there's a lot of excitement around uh, with the uh, new crop of fillies and colts uh, that were uh, purchased at the sale last fall, another record sale at the Atlantic uh, sale, the Atlantic Classic sale in Crapo, so an exciting year. So I just want to wish everyone involved in the PEI standard bread uh, industry in Prince Edward Island who do so much for our economy uh, to have uh, good luck and, uh, and, and a good racing season. Also, our provincial golf courses are starting to open up uh, along with the other uh, private courses that uh, make PEI a special destination throughout the, uh, the summer months for sure. And, Golf has really seen a tremendous growth trajectory, particularly uh, since the uh, beginning of, of COVID. Uh, it was one of the, uh, uh, it seemed to be COVID proof industries was golf and it's been growing ever since. So all of those who participate in the golf industry and PEI, I wanna thank them and wish them a good season as well. <clears throat> I was also pleased, uh, as, as many know in the legislature but might not know who are tuned in, that our uh, health and Minister of Health and Wellness is undergoing some surgery at the hospital today. It's been in the works for a couple of years. It's nothing uh, uh, we weren't prepared for, so I will be acting as the Minister of Health. And uh, I was, uh, uh, nobody else seemed to want the job, so I, uh, I took it on uh, uh, eagerly, but no, quite honestly. But I was pleased in my, you know, my, first few moments in the role that the nurses union ratified their agreement uh, uh, for uh, the basic contract, so I was happy to see that. And they were favorable. They signed off on it this week, though. So uh, we'll take it wherever we can get it. But uh, no, quite honestly, I, I was really happy that we were able to come to such a, an important deal with our, our nurses union. There are lots of uh, uh, critical areas that we addressed in the contract along with uh, finances. So that was a very positive step. And I want to thank our nurses for doing a wonderful job and wish all of my colleagues today a good day of debate in the legislature. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Leader of the opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and uh, I want to welcome all those who are watching online today and also those who are into the gallery today. I know we have a few here from uh, um, friends from the Foster family. We have uh, Lyndon Maho, we have Mary Noy, and Aletha Mitchell Power and Wendy Ross uh, joining us here today. I too want to congratulate uh, Commander Michelle Hopping in her new role and wish her all the best and her Naval family that's with her today to support her. I'm sorry I have my back to you, but just with the, the setup in here today, it's, it, it is what it is, unfortunately. Um, so please excuse my back. I also want to send out uh, congratulations to all UPEI uh, graduates today from the convocation this morning that uh, handed out degrees in arts, education, and the graduate studies, and also the Master of Global uh, Studies. And also, a uh, huge congratulations to the honor an honorary degree, which was awarded to uh, Dr. Uh, Kathy Martin from San Hope uh, PEI. And she has a long career in uh, scientific research and her contributions to orientology. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Member Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I too would like to start by welcoming those to the gallery. Lyndon Mayhew, of course, who's a uh, 
used to be at least a, a citizen in District 17 and a foster parent of children at Englewood School whom I knew uh, back in my previous life. So nice to see you, Lyndon, and everybody else in the fostering community. Also, I see Bethany Collicut McNabb, and um, as she calls him, Little Pete, her son, who's sitting in the corner there. Hi, Little Pete. <laughs> nice to see you both today, and I know that uh, both Bethany and Little Pete follow the proceedings in here very closely. Um, and I, too, would like to welcome the family from HMCS Queen Charlotte. I was so sorry I didn't make it to the event last night. Um, but I do want to congratulate wholeheartedly Lieutenant Commander Michelle Hopping on becoming the new Commander-in-Chief, the first woman ever to take this position, I should say, at uh, HMCS Charlottetown. Um, there was a ceremony last night, and um, I know that Michelle, her <laughs> desire is both to, to run, of course, this wonderful organization for as long as she is the Commander, the Lieutenant Commander, but also to inspire women, young women, to join the Canadian Forces. And I wish you well in, in both of those endeavors. Uh, the unit turns 100 years old, I believe, later this year in September. Um, I also want to give, out a sh uh, give a shout out to the nurses across this province. As the Premier said, they just successfully signed uh, an agreement, and that's wonderful. Um, but they haven't always felt so valued uh, over the last little while. And many nurses have reached out to our office, particularly ICU nurses from the Prince County Hospital. And uh, you know, it takes courage to do that and to speak up on behalf of the system they work in and on behalf of Islanders, which is ultimately what they're doing because we all depend on that system. So thank you to the nurses, uh, the ICU nurses at PCH who have reached out to us. I really appreciate that. And uh, I'm so grateful for the work that you do. Uh, this weekend on Saturday at the Murchison Park and Centre, there's a cleanup. This is in Clyde River. It's an annual event. and. Um, usually it doesn't take very long, but I know this, this Saturday they've scheduled, I think, four and a half hours to do it because there's a, a lot of cleanup after Fiona, as there is everywhere, of course. And that's in Clyde River. It's on Saturday from 8.30 to 12. I guess that's three and a half hours, not four and a half hours. My math is not great. I share that with the member from Charlottetown Victoria Park. And finally, Madam Speaker, uh, the Cineplex opens up again. Um, I think it's tomorrow, maybe even tonight, here in Charlottetown, and for those cinephiles who've been missing the opportunity, I mean, of course, we have the beautiful city cinema downtown, and many of us have, have been there frequently to watch movies. Having the Cineplex back open is a, a great excitement for many people, including our Chief of Staff, Katie Rankin, on the second floor. Katie actually used to work for a time for Cineplex, and I know she loves her movies, and both Barbie and Oppenheimer are opening. I'm not sure which one of those she's going to pick, Madam Speaker. Maybe she'll go to both. It'll be a double header, which would be quite the mix. Anyway, um, congratulations to Cineplex on opening up again. I'm sure there are many, many islanders who are celebrating that. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Member from Gordon King Cora. Thank you, Madam Speaker. To, uh, welcome everybody here from uh, Borden King Cora today, of course, and everybody in our gallery. But especially, we have some special guests with us, and I feel very safe with all the, uh, the groups standing behind me, which I'd like to recognize. Uh, we have Lieutenant Commander Michelle Hopping, who assumed command last night from uh, Lieutenant Commander John McDonald. I was at that ceremony last night, and it was great to see so many people out to that. All the best to Michelle and, and in your endeavors too going forward, John. We also are joined by Master Sailor Daniel Scott, Sailor First Class Daniel Bridges, Petty Officer First Class Trent Fullerton, Petty Officer Second Class Troy Arsenal, Master Sailor Lucas Gallant, Sailor First Class Anna Bellin, Lieutenant Spencer Lee, Petty Officer First Class Noel Menke, and also Lieutenant Michael Bergeron. Thank you very much for joining, and I'll be speaking about the unit a little bit later. Thank you. Member from Summerside, Wilmot. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <coughs> uh, I'm pleased to rise today. It's the first time I've taken the opportunity to do this, and I just want to welcome everybody that's in the galley. Uh, especially a District 21 resident that I noticed over there, uh, Mary Noy, welcome. Uh, I just wanted to take this time to thank everybody that worked on my team to make this possible. I didn't do that yet, and it was great. Uh, I had a lot of support, a lot of, a lot of people that helped us. Uh, I want to thank all the residents and voting constituents in District 21 for putting their trust in me, and just want to let them know I will not let them down. Uh, and I also wanted to bring attention to a name I missed yesterday, my member's statement. Abdel Rashidid, 
He won an award with the City of Summerside last night, and I neglected to mention him when I was flipping through notes. I put him aside, and I apologize for that. I, he won the award with the City of Summerside for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Champion. And it was, uh, when you were there and you heard the write-up on him, it was quite remarkable. I can't believe that I missed someone like that. Speaks four languages and does everything he can for new immigrants coming to Summerside. So, sorry about that. Uh, and the Premier beat me to the punch on the harness race and starting in Summerside. Uh, SRW, historic SRW, opens up this Monday. We've had a couple qualifiers up there already and it's going to be great. We should have a full house. Invite everybody to come down. Uh, and I want to try once a week to acknowledge a District 21 resident that uh, deserves some acknowledgement and I want to take this time to acknowledge Doug Dexter. Doug's done instrumental stuff with Summerside minor hockey and whatnot and recently did something that was dear to me and I just want to thank him. Honorable Minister of Social Development, no, Seniors and how? Seniors. Try that again. Seniors, sorry, social development and seniors. Yes. Thank Excuse you, Madam me. Speaker. <laughs> um, thank you. Uh, it, it's a true honor to rise for the first time to the provincial legislature. So thank you for that opportunity. I'd like to start by saying hello to everyone watching from District 22, Summerside South Drive. And I want to thank my family who have been supporting me through this new journey. I'd like to welcome HMS Charlottetown today. Nice to have you here. And I'm honored to welcome members from the PEI Federation of Foster Families to the gallery today. Welcome to Mary Noy, President of the Federation, Aletha Power, Secretary and Board Member, and, and Board Members Wendy Ross, Lyndon Mayhew, and Megan Yonker. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Ms. Honorable member from Morel Dona. Oh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, congratulations uh, to you. And, um, Madam Speaker, I uh, just wanted to say hi to uh, and thank you to all the residents of uh, District 7 uh, on the recent election. Um, uh, my family, in particular, were very supportive, so supportive. Uh, Joey McDonald and, and Olive Drake, my uh, co chairs, and Paul McDonald, my president, we had the, the largest team ever. It went uh, it's smooth, efficient, and, and very successful, so my, I'm in debt to them all. Thank you. I just want to say thanks uh, to the uh, Honourable Minister and, and the member from Borden for, for uh, reading uh, the names into the record for the two amazing groups that we have here in the gallery as well. It's, uh, it's pretty special. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'd like to recognize uh, another big election. Uh, Abbeywood First Nation uh, aligns, uh, two of the three reserves aligned with District 7, Madam Speaker, and I want to congratulate uh, Chief uh, Junior Gould, Councillor uh, Sherry J uh, Bernard, Councillor Chris Jadis, and Councillor um, Jacob Jadis on a resounding victory in the most recent band election. It's no surprise, uh, Madam Speaker, considering the the economic success uh, that the uh, Headwood First Nation is experiencing, but also the real sense of community and pride and, and togetherness that they're uh, that the you know that's been really strengthened over the past number of years too. So just my congratulations. Uh, to Edward First Nation on a, on a very successful election, and uh, good luck to all the new and returning members here in the legislature. Thank you. Honorable <coughs> Minister of Education, Early Years, and Minister Responsible for the Status of Women. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise and to welcome back all of my colleagues today. Welcome to all those joining us here in the gallery, and a big congratulations to Lieutenant Gup Commander Michelle Hopping on assuming command of the Charlottetown-based post. Uh, big congratulations to you. Uh, I also want to say hello to all those tuning in from <coughs> District 9, and uh, especially uh, two constituents, who Gordon and Myrna Babineau, who are celebrating their 60th wed wedding anniversary today. I know they're tuning in today. I met with them this morning, and it is just so obvious that they they are just in, as in love today as they were 60 years ago. Uh, their daughter Lori told me a story about uh, while Myrna was attending nursing school, she was staying at Beaconsfield House and of course she would skip past curfew and meet Gordon on some <laughs> little dates in the evening. So that was a cute little story, but they told me lots of stories this morning and I, I just, uh, these two are shining examples of kind, 
good-hearted people, um, Madam Speaker, and I was so honored to spend some time with them today on their special day. Congratulations to you both. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Member from O'Leary and Burness. Speaker, and I too want to welcome those in the gallery as well as those watching back home in the ride in Valeria Inverness. Uh, it's not very often I get many people that come from the ride in Valeria Inverness, and today I do have one. I have uh, Wendy Ross, so I want to acknowledge Wendy. Wendy lives on the Bolter Road, and she uh, is in the poll, the West Point poll, and I got a little bit of a member statement on West Point a little later on here, uh, Madam Speaker. I also have to say hi to uh, Bethany Colica McNabb and little Pete. I'm quite confident that. Uh, Bethany's father, Harvey, and Carol Ann will probably be watching back home online. Uh, Harvey's a dedicated watcher and observer of the, the provincial legislature here. And uh, I also have some connections with uh, Bethany and little Pete as well, because I have a good luck charm in my district, and it's called uh, Michaela Bernard. And uh, Bethany would be her aunt. And uh, it's sort of a, a tradition that I get a picture with Michaela and have it in my campaign uh, photos. And so far, she's uh, she's a winner every time. So, <laughs> so I got to thank her for that. So, uh, so anyway, welcome to the gallery, and all the best. I'm a member from Rustico Emerald. Everyone from District 18, Rustical Emerald, watching, and of course everyone in the gallery. H and S, uh, Charlottetown, great to see you here, as well as uh, constituent. Nice to see you as well, and uh, and the the Association of Foster Families. Um, I uh, wanted to recognize Nicole Brenner as well. I, I missed her. Um, she won the faculty award, the Bonnie L. McPherson Memorial Award, to a graduating student who exemplified excellence and scholarship of the diversity and social justice program. A great award, so congratulations to her graduate here at UPEI. Um, I, also, I also wanted to mention that on Monday night, uh, we, we had a climate uh, change adaptation information session and Peter Nishimura from the Department of uh, Environment, Energy and Climate Action came out. It was something I'd asked for in the legislature in November. We had to wait a little longer than I wanted to, but we had it and it was a great session. We had about 25 people there um, and, and it was very, very useful. Um, and I wanted to especially thank uh, the Trout River Environment uh, um, uh, 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 Watershed Group, <laughs> Trek because uh, they, they did a lot of work in, in, uh, in helping with that. Um, also, you, everyone's probably wondering what we're wearing on our lapels here. And this, this is in honor of uh, Vishavanka Day, if I'm saying it properly, or Embroidered Shirt Day. And um, this is a, this is a U Ukrainian um, day that uh, that's celebrated around the world. And uh, uh, I want to stand, I actually uh, lived for some time Madam Speaker, in Vagreville in Alberta, which is, of course, has strong Ukrainian roots and is home of uh, the, the Easter egg and the, the, called the Pasanka. Um, but th this, it's very important to, uh, to recognize this because there are so many Ukrainians in Canada and, and indeed on Prince Edward Island. It holds significance uh, in symbolizing Ukrainian heritage, dignity, and it represents the resilience of the Ukrainian people in the face of adversity. And of course, that's what we're seeing a lot of right now in the Ukraine with, uh, with Russia. So that's what that's all about. And I wanted to give a shout out to uh, my cousin uh, Bruce and his wife Oksana, who is Ukrainian descent, and their daughter Natasha, who is a Ukrainian dancer at the, the national level as part of the Shumka Ukrainian Dance Group. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Member from Charlton Winslow. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. It is always a pleasure to rise and welcome everybody who's watching online in uh, District 10, Charlottetown, Winslow. Um, I do want to thank uh, all of the uh, visitors in uniform. Really appreciate your service and really appreciate you being here and hopefully you enjoy the proceedings today. Um, also, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, so when I came into this house uh, back in 2020 at the time during the by-election, I wasn't able to go on a door-to-door -door campaign like a traditional election campaign. So. Uh, most recently, I did have the opportunity, and it was great because you actually get to see people, some faces that you'd recognize through the district. So I do want to say hello to two constituents, Aletha Mitchell-Power and also Beth, uh, Bethany Collicott mcnabb Now, it's funny because uh, both uh, Aletha and Bethany might not see the same political views as I do, but I do notice that little Pete has a blue shirt on, so <laughs> Pete is also a constituent of District 10, so I'm hoping someday that blue shirt might be uh, something that I can work on. So I do want to uh, just welcome you to the gallery and enjoy your time here today. Thank you. Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure. 
Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Madam Speaker, and it's certainly a pleasure to rise today. I uh, want to give a shout out and a big hello to all of the ones watching in from District 26, Albert and Bloomfield. Uh, to all the ones that are service personnel in the gallery, certainly thank you for your service. And to the Foster Parents Association, thank you for your work, your great work and service to our island children. Great to see you here with us today, Mary. Uh, back when I was uh, Minister of Social Development and Housing, had uh, the opportunity to, uh, to meet with Mary and work with Mary on a number of initiatives. So again, thank you. It's great to see your uh, involvement still with uh, the foster parents. Uh, also, it was referenced, uh, mentioned uh, by the uh, Premier, uh, but the nurses contract was uh, ratified. That is great news. Uh, certainly want to thank, too, all of the nurses right across the province, but certainly at Western Hospital, the ones on the floor. I've seen the great work firsthand over the last several weeks with uh, my dad being a patient at Western Hospital. A big thank you to the nursing staff on the floor, but not only on the floor, uh, Madam Speaker, but also in the emergency room, the nurses that go above and beyond together with the rest of the team at the ER at Western Hospital, where they see upwards of 10,000 patients per year. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Madam Speaker. I, th I think everyone has uh, given their greetings who wanted to, and I just want to stand up myself and welcome those joining us in the gallery, uh, Foster Parents Association, what a wonderful job you do and how needed it is for this province. And uh, it'd be great if we didn't need you, but we do, and we appreciate what you do. And for everyone joining us from HMCS Char uh, Queen Charlotte, um, Michelle Hopping, congratulations, Commander, on uh, your, your new role. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Spencer Lee, who, uh, I used to be my communications officer back when I was finance minister for a time, and then he moved on to bigger and better things, I guess. And uh, but I know he's always been been involved, and I really appreciate what each and every one of you do. And anyway, everyone have a great day. Okay, statements by members, starting with the member from Borden Concora. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to recognize the centennial of the Naval Reserve in Canada and one of our own very own units, His Majesty's Canadian ship, HMCS Queen Charlotte, here in Charlottetown. HMCS Queen Charlotte was established as a Royal Canadian Navy Volunteer Reserve Unit in September of 1923, as one of the first in the country. Madam Speaker, the RCNVR became the backbone of the Royal Canadian Navy, recruiting officers and sailors from across the country. Today it celebrates its centennial. The Naval Reserve has 100 soldiers, or pardon me, sailors, based out of His Majesty's Canadian ship, Queen Charlotte, right here in Charlottetown. These citizen sailors have been pillars in their communities, whether training for service at sea or coming to the aid of their neighbors when needed. And I must make a note, I think it was uh, two or three years ago that there was a, a boat accident in the city of Charlottetown in the harbor and just happened that our sailors were on station doing training and responded to that accident in the harbour. Naval reservists, including those from HMCS Queen Charlotte, have deployed with the Canadian Armed Forces on operations both at sea and on land and around the world. From counter-narcotics missions in the Caribbean and, the, and to Pacific and to sovereignty patrols in the, in the Arctic. I believe also we also have uh, some of our sailors on station over around the, uh, the uh, action going on around the Ukraine and the, uh, the Baltic Sea. They responded when called upon to support provincial and local authorities at home and in Canada, including providing support to flooding in Quebec and the prairies, fires in British Columbia, and hurricanes on the East Coast. And more recently, supporting the care of seniors in Ontario and in Quebec during the early days of the COVID-19 pandemic. For 100 years, Madam Speaker, the Naval Reserve have played a critical role in Canada's safety and security as a vital element of the Royal Canadian Navy and the Canadian Armed Forces. In the gallery today, we have representatives from the local Naval Reserve Division, HMCS Queen Charlotte. At this time, I ask that we recognize the Royal Canadian Navy Reserve by honoring their place in our nation the province's military history and heritage as they celebrate the 100 years of service excellence across the country and in our province. 
Madam Speaker, congratulations to Lieutenant Commander Michelle Hopping in assuming command at the ceremony last evening where she relieved Lieutenant Commander John McDonald. During, during 2023, Plena joined us in recognizing the Naval Reserve Centennial and their place in our province's military history and heritage. And I ask this House and all politicians to support our men and women in uniform. <laughs> Member from O'Leary and Burness. Thank you. Speaker, last night I attended the annual meeting of the West Point Development Corporation. This is a nonprofit organization mandated to own and manage the historic West Point Lighthouse, one of PEI's premier tourism attractions. It also operates Willie's Wharf Restaurant, which will be opening on June 8th for this season. The, West, the Development Corporation also advocates for issues within the West Point community and works in the cooperation with the Cedar Dunes Provincial Park. West Point Harbor Authority, West Point Fire Department, and the West Point Craft Guild. This is a unique style of community advocacy and has worked for this community for many years. In their financial statements, the corporation directly manages $1.2 million worth of assets. The West Point Lighthouse Inn seen a significant increase in occupancy in 2022, generating close to $100,000 more than expected even after losing three weeks due to the damage caused by Hurricane Fiona, which caused for a premature closing of the inn. For a tourism business in rural PEI, this accomplishment should not be understated. Credit should be given to Lighthouse Manager Kendra Smith and her staff. Credit also should be given to the hardworking volunteers of the volunteer board, including Chair Harvey Stewart, members Tiffany Bolter, Jackie Stewart, Andrea Ellis, Greg McCormick, Nancy McMillan, and Bev Bolter. Madam Speaker, this organization does rely on government support for some wages, but they employ over 20 islanders on a seasonal basis. This is significant in rural PEI, and both levels of government need to be more supportive. This means not only by being there for the pro with the programs, but to attend their annual meeting, to work with the volunteers, and point to opportunities where government can help. At their recent annual meeting, I was surprised by the lack of attention government gave to this organization. I attended, and seen, I attended myself and seen one of PEI Park staff members there. Where was the Economic Development Department? What about the Department of Environment uh, and Climate Change? What about Tourism PEI? I question if they didn't come simply because West Point is too far out of the way for an evening meeting in May, or is it that meetings too far outside of the cities of Charlottetown and Summerside that government won't pay mileage to a staff to attend? Or is there some other reason? If they had attended, <laughs> they should have, would have learned about the shoreline protection of armor stone being used to repair the beach and protect the lighthouse from storm surges. They would have learned how projects like this have allowed beach walkers access to the beach in front of the lighthouse between the water's edge and the armor stone. This is relevant information and could certainly be applicable in other areas. I realize that government and staff cannot attend every meeting, but after recent challenges like COVID, Fiona, and labor shortages, it's important to learn and appreciate the toll that this has had on rural communities. Government should encourage departmental staff to attend meetings of stakeholder organizations and work with them and help them <coughs> through their challenges and ways so that they can move forward. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable Member from Kensington Hall. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise today to recognize Claudia Campbell, a 25-year-old from Kensington, who recently placed second in the Big Brother Canada season 11 finale. Big Brother Canada is a Canadian television reality show in which a group of contestants live in a house that is isolated from the outside world as they compete for a $100,000 cash prize as well as additional prizes from the show's sponsors. Every week, the contestants compete in several competitions to win power and safety inside the house before voting off a contestant during the eviction. Throughout Big Brother Canada Season 11, there were 16 contestants. Although Claudia said she may have been underestimated, she was most proud of her success in competitions, which propelled her to continue each week. She used her 
interpersonal skills, intelligence, and strategy to make it all the way to the end. Claudia was happy with the outcome and proud to be part of once in a lifetime experience. Congratulations, Claudia. You made your province proud, especially your hometown, Kensington, proud. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Questions by members, starting with responses to questions taken as, as notice. <clears throat> the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. With health care crisis unfolding in real time, the official opposition is committed to asking health care questions uh, daily, so Islanders know that someone is keeping this government accountable for their missteps on this file. My question today was going to be to the Minister of Health, but the Premier had mentioned he's not here, and I can't see whether he's here or not. He has him so far back in the corner, I, I really can't see. So my question will have to be today to the Premier. Your CEO of Health PEI stated the other day that the ICU of Prince County Hospital shouldn't be considered a real ICU. Do you agree with this statement from your Health PEI CEO? Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I can assure the Honourable Leader of the Opposition that he can't miss me. Uh, I'm in right in front of him here, and uh, by the look of myself on TV, uh, I'm, I'm, if the camera adds 10 pounds, there's four cameras on me in here, Madam Speaker. But, uh, um, You're not alone. Uh, but uh, it's quite ser seriously, uh, um, I think uh, the CEO of Health PEI uh, took some time last night to clarify the comments and uh, and, and obviously did not mean uh, the intent that was uh, uh, taken by so many. Uh, I have great respect for everyone who works within the health system, uh, for the CEO of Health PEI as well, and, uh, and I was glad to see that opportunity taken last night to clarify those remarks and to also clarify uh, his belief and, and, and hopes uh, uh, from the system and those who work within it. Leader of the opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I'm glad to hear that the Premier acknowledged uh, that an apology was needed in that response. Uh, but I have to wonder if this is yet just another case as do as I say, not as I do with the Premier. So Islanders remember that it was th this Premier who forced nurses and frontline staff to rally on the steps of the Confederation Centre just to have their voices heard but two months ago. Question to the Premier. Will you finally stand up in this House and apologize for the disrespect that you and your government have shown our island health care staff, patients and family over the past two months? Well, uh, Madam Speaker, uh, I have great respect for those who work within our health care system and do so much to try to provide a quality level of health care for islanders uh, and they're doing it under some very stressful circumstances uh, that were obviously exposed through the COVID situation and, and continue to be exposed today. Uh, uh, I, I have a great working relationship with, with the, uh, the leadership uh, from our, uh, from whether it's our, uh, the College of Physicians, the Nurses Union and others. Uh, I, I want to be a good broker uh, and to try to continue to work forward and to try to work with all of those and I have nothing but the utmost respect for those who do that every day. It's not just a job, it's, it's a public service and they do it well and I respect them very much for it. Our leader of the opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it's no secret that food and grocery prices are at an all-time high. Despite inflation continuing to fall closer to pre-pandemic levels, when in fact, um, as of April of 2023, PI inflation is below um, the national... In fact, as of April 20, 2023, PI's inflation is below the national average, but food prices remain high, and a majority of grocery chains are raking in record profits. Question to the Minister responsible for food insecurity. Can you explain to Islanders what your government plans to do to combat inflated food prices here in Prince Edward Island? Honourable Minister of Social Development and Seniors. I'm just... I'm going to apologize. Oh, here we go. Sorry. I found it. I was just... Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Thank you to the Honourable Member for the uh, question. Eliminating poverty is a big job, and we are working towards the ambitious goal to eliminate poverty by 235. Forty million dollars was invested in social programs, including social assistance, increasing shelter ceilings, and the Seniors Independent Initiative over the last three years. And these increases mean that Islanders' needs for receiving more resources to better meet their basic needs, including food, housing and security, transportation and communication, clothing and optical. Thank you. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. 
Thank you, Madam Speaker. That was very, very broad. But I'm going to speak, and I ask you specifically regarding food prices. So to me, that was, uh, at the best, uh, really a non-answer to that. It's pretty clear that the government has no plan, no plan to combat the inflated food prices in the grocery stores here in Prince Edward Island. And they are out of touch with everyday islanders who are trying to keep healthy foods in their home. Question to the Minister, can you tell the House what percentage of children lived in a food insecure household in 2019 when your party first came into power? Honourable Minister of Social Development and uh, Seniors. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I do not have the answer to that. I'll bring it back. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you um, very much, Madam Speaker. I'll, I'll save you that trouble. It was 24.5%. So it's concerning that the minister doesn't know her own government's record on food insecurity. <laughs> Question to the minister. What percentage of island children are... <laughs> Question to the minister. What percentage of island children are living in food insecurity today? Honourable Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Thank you for the question, Honourable Member. Um, with the few short weeks that I've been here, I apologize to to let you know that I do not have the answer to that, and I will bring that back. Thank you. I'll relate to the opposition. I'll give you the trouble again. It's 35.1 percent. So now I know, I know you're new. I, I, I'll give you that. But it's important to be in touch with your file on a very important issue. And we are aware that, oh, that, that there's over a third of island children uh, that are living with food insecurity here in Prince Edward Island. So question to the same minister. So. I'm not sure if you don't know, you should be up to date on that, but are you basically uh, refusing to publicly admit uh, information that you're, you're on food insecurity, that, uh, that you don't know the facts, or that you just really are out of touch with, with what is going on um, in the island homes across Prince Edward Island, with one third of island children not having um, um, food? The healthy food every day, they go to bed hungry. So, so, okay. This is a very important issue, all right? So it's over a third of island children on Prince Edward Island go to bed every night hungry. You guys are either neglecting to, or not neglecting, you're, you're deflecting. Honorable so. member, do you have a question? Yes, I do. So can I ask, are you, is that okay if I ask right now? Okay. So I'm going to ask you, Minister, do you think this is a, a situation that all island children, let alone the third of island children that go to bed hungry every night, is this acceptable? Honourable Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It certainly isn't acceptable. And I just want to let you know that the government is committed to enhancing food security for all islanders, especially children. We have made historic investments in social assistance, social programs of $40 million in the last three years. In, including, I, I'm not finished. Including $7 million social program rates, which is helping strengthen food and housing poverty. Last year, the school food program served 470,000 students. Our leader of the opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. So, Madam Speaker, we as Liberals believe in helping those who need it the most. The Conservative government doesn't even know how badly Islanders are struggling to put food on the table. I spoke to a parent just yesterday, and she told me that every week she has to make choices between putting healthy food on the table paying off her credit cards that she had to use just, just to bridge the gap, or simply going without. Now, this is an incre incredibly sad situation to hear about, and it's unfortunately too common. Question to the minister. Would you be able to look at this parent in the eye and tell them that they don't have to worry about next week's grocery bill if you don't even know how many islanders are living in food insecurity? Honorable Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Yes, I am willing to look them in the eye because I understand that they, you know, hunger is not for anyone on, this, on Prince Edward Island. No one deserves to be hungry. And this government is doing everything they can. They've invested $40 million in the last three years, and 470,000 children have been fed with meals in the school program. 
Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, this is a government that has obviously no plan and no knowledge of how many island families are in need of food. Madam Speaker, we have established that this minister doesn't know how many islanders are going without food um, and they live in insecure situations. It's highly alarming that CBC re report from April of, uh, of this year, they uncovered the numbers that all islanders should be concerned about. In March of 2023, 4,700 meals were served through the soup kitchen. 930 island families received assistance through the food bank. Question to the minister, will you tell all members of this house how much of an increase that represents. Uh, Minister of Social Development Seniors. Uh, thank you, for, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you to the mem uh, honourable member for the question. As I said, I've been here a few weeks, and I will definitely bring that percentages back back to you. I do not have all the percentages, and I'm not going to stand here and say that I do. I simply haven't had the opportunity to find that. Thank you, honourable leader of the opposition. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Madam, Madam Speaker. The answer is 25 percent. 25 percent from last year. It, it, that's, that's a huge, a significant increase that affects many, many families here in Prince Edward Island. And I would just beg you to please uh, get the knowledge that you need on this file in order to make plans, because we need a plan to feed these families. So, Madam Speaker, we heard um, that more and more Islanders are at food banks and soup kitchens. We are seeing community fridges popping up right across the province at alarming rates. And thank goodness for volunteers who are managing these sources of healthy food in our communities. Question to the Minister. Why is your government taking a hands-off approach to rising food costs instead of actively working to reduce the burden of food costs for Islanders? Honourable Minister of Social Development Seniors. Again, I am very um, concerned that there are hungry children in the world, or in, the, in Prince Edward Island. We've made historic investments in social assistance and social programs of $40 million over the last three years, and 470,000 school children have been fed. I just continue to say that we are concerned, and I will bring back any information that you need, or you can come and speak with me at the department if you'd like, and we could work something out. But the short, four, or the short few weeks that I've had, I don't have statistics on everything. Thank you. Honourable Member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Access to housing is a fundamental to Islanders, yet it's been overlooked by this government. Inadequate and insecure housing is a reality for far too many islanders, and the consequences have been too many islanders living in unsafe conditions. This can lead to increased vulnerability and violence, discrimination, social exclusion, and significant obstacles to securing employment. As noted in the speech from the throne, and I quote, housing is a continuum that includes temporary shelter, transitional housing, structured housing, rental units, cooperatives, and single housing. Knowing the scope of the issue, we're fa facing is important. Question to the Minister of Housing. How many islanders are unhoused? Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I'm sure that uh, the opposition staff has uh, done the research and provided them with facts and figures that perhaps none of us on this side <laughs> have not yet memorized. But I will, I will say that um, I'm quite aware that we have a significant housing problem in Prince Edward Island. All of, that, all of us heard this at the doors throughout the election campaign. All of us understand, I believe the leader of the third party uh, recognized in some comments yesterday that we need to work on the housing issue throughout the entire continuum. We need more housing from shelter space to market space. We all acknowledge the problem. We acknowledged in the speech from the throne that our housing programs were chronically underfunded here. We have a mandate. We've put a priority on this issue. I take it very seriously. I met many people throughout my district, throughout the election campaign, who are um, housing insecure. And it, uh, it, it bothers me. We need to lift people up and provide them with the resources they need to live in dignity. And I assure you that we take this as a strong priority of this government. We'll work very hard to alleviate the problems in the housing crisis here. Honourable member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Well, that's a good first answer, not knowing the end of the community. So congratulations on your, your first answer to this question. But well, I know you have the answer there for me. 
Well, well you, know, you know what's funny? I, I thought I would, I should have the answer, but I've asked your government for four years for that answer, and it wasn't coming to me. So it's a little bit frustrating on this side of the house. And here's another one: the homeless individuals and families information system is the way that your department and this province collects data. It's called the HIFAS system. The HIFAS system, Minister, how many islanders are recorded on the HIFAS system? Oh, Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I know that we are in. The, we suffer from somewhat of a lack of uh, of, uh, of of data around our housing uh, issue in Prince Edward Island. We are in the process of marrying some of our data with data from Statistics Canada. We do expect to start receiving some of that back to give us further insight into specific data sets in Prince Edward Island regarding our, our housing situation. It will it will help it guide policy into the future and help us get out of this crisis. <coughs> Honourable member from Charlottetown, West Royalty. I'm not talking. I'm not talking about data. The hyphen systems measures islanders who are unhoused in Prince Edward Island. You have it. It's the, it's done by. It's done in coordination from a lot of different groups. So you have it. And can you bring that back to me? Would be a question, but I don't want to blow my question on that. So here's the next one, <laughs> Minister. You chair the the special cabinet committee on housing. According to the speech from the throne, your committee will focus on finding ways to immediately increase housing starts over the next 24 months, given that housing for the most vulnerable is clearly part of the housing continuum. Do you think it was appropriate to leave the Minister of Social Development and Seniors off this committee? How will you develop a housing plan if you don't have input from the Minister responsible for our most vulnerable? Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I would say that um, I have uh, we, we have a, a strong membership of the committee to begin with. I look forward to the work that we're doing. And uh, I have a strong relationship with the Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Um, all of the priorities that, that make their way through our Committee on Housing will make their way through the Cabinet. Uh, and uh, I have no concerns whatsoever that will coordinate where required. Member of Char from Charlottetown West Royalty. Yeah, well, and maybe there was an oversight, but I would like to see the Minister of Social Development responsible for uh, our most vulnerable on that committee instead of maybe the Environment Minister on that particular committee because that's where it needs to be done. <laughs> just this week, just this week, we've, we've heard from Blooming House and they clearly raise concerns of lack of access to transitional housing. Sadly, some women have been forced to stay for over two years at Blooming House. And they were very clear, and I'm very clear, that this is a shelter, not transitional housing. And this has been operational since 2019, and it's been full. And people needing housing in that area are seniors, young people, people who have fallen on hard times, just can't afford, just, just, just there's various reasons why they're there. Minister, we don't have the transitional housing, and actually this government has gutted transitional housing. I want to ask you as a new minister, how many new transitional housing units will you create over the next two years? Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I understand that it is a challenge to move people from our shelters uh, into transitional housing. Um, I know that the the previous government here spent a great deal of effort to make sure that our shelter system here in Charlottetown was adequately resourced with our, our new facility at Park Street. We will concentrate on helping people move through that continuum, through transitional housing to attainable housing, into the community, more community housing across that continuum. But as I said in my first answer, we understand that we are under-resourced across that entire continuum. Yes, we need to uh, work our way through that continuum and continue to provide more housing. We have a great relationship with Blooming House. Uh, our staff work with them to try to find spaces for, for people to move uh, through uh, that continuum of housing. And that's just something that it's, we know is a challenge and we'll continue to work on it as we can. We don't have any transitional housing because you didn't build transitional housing over the fourth year. You went down in transitional housing. You're the fourth minister in four years. I've been here every year looking at this file, and I am upset at this point. 
and now at you, Minister, at what's happened over the last four years. We have a crisis out there, and Blooming House is just an example. When we're in a shelter system, we cannot move people on to the next right up uh, to, to get them supports, and this has become a major important issue. When will this government start to support the planning for our most vulnerable people in Prince Edward Island? Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, we have added transitional housing space. Uh, in fact, I was speaking with uh, at the Mayor's Roundtable on uh, homelessness uh, uh, last week. I was speaking with members of the Salvation Army who operate uh, transitional housing on Weymouth Street. Um, as you know, I understand that you're very well versed on, on the situation there. Uh, we can, they can, uh, Salvation Army continues to move people in, into there on a staggered basis. Uh, they do have some beds still available, but they're staggering the entry to the facility to make sure that everyone's needs are met, they're settled before new residents are moved in. So we're continuing to move people into transitional housing in, in that location, and we'll continue to create more locations, more units as we uh, are able to. Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. There are rarely uh, quick or easy fixes to complicated problems, and that's never more true than when we look at our healthcare system. One proposed so-called solution that we've seen growing in popularity amongst conservative governments across Canada is to farm out public services like surgeries to private clinics. This was done with a promise of greater efficiencies, of better access to services, and of reduced costs. Recent Canadian data, and I'm going to table this later this morning, suggests that the opposite is true. After tens of millions of dollars of public funds being spent on surgeries to for-profit private clinics, wait times are no better, in some cases they're worse, and costs have soared. A question to the Premier. Can you assure Islanders unequivocally that you won't be following the lead of your Conservative colleagues like Doug Ford and Danielle Smith and that there is no place on Prince Edward Island for private, for-profit <coughs> surgical clinics. Honourable Premier. Uh, yes. Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you. Yesterday, your Health Minister supported our motion to adopt the national standards of care in long-term care homes here on Prince Edward Island, and I was really delighted when that motion passed unanimously in this House. And I look forward to those standards being adopted in regulation in our laws uh, that govern the LTCs here on Prince Edward Island as soon as possible. To the Premier, one area where there is private delivery of publicly funded health services is in long-term care homes. How will you take steps to provide better and safer care to island seniors and shift these care homes from private, for-profit ownership to public ownership? Honourable Premier. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and that is a, a good question, and it's a, it's a complicated question and situation given the fact that PEI has probably more of a hybrid model of delivery with public and private than a lot of jurisdictions. Uh, I do think there's a lot of wonderful people providing wonderful care across Prince Edward Island uh, through the private model, which is publicly funded, of course. But uh, I do think we also learned through COVID and, and post-COVID that uh, we have to uh, have a greater focus on the standards and the delivery of service for those, uh, in particular in this province and in this region where we have some of the most uh, uh, rapidly aging population uh, in the country. Uh, so I think what we need to do, uh, following up with the Michelle Dorsey report, which we hope will come soon, uh, uh, and marry that with the uh, recommendations uh, at the national level. I think overall we want to work to deliver the best possible long-term care service delivery uh, so those uh, in PEI who age can do so with dignity and do so safely and, and, and to be at home when they're there. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Leader of the Third Party. You know, I must say, I, with all due respect, I love you as our Health Minister, Premier. Another area where there is... Pro where, 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 <laughs> Another area where there is private another area where there is private delivery of publicly funded services is in virtual care. Provision of virtual care is pulling some doctors here on Prince Edward Island away from the public service from their patients. They're leaving their jobs to provide virtual care to island patients, making access for islanders, of course, even worse than it already is. 
to the Premier. Is your government working on policies to move virtual care within the public system? And if so, when can we expect to see public delivery of virtual care starting here on Prince Edward Island? Honourable Premier. Yeah, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And that is uh, uh, another great question. And I think it really stems from the fact that I think we're living through a very transformational time in our society, and particularly around the delivery of health care, as we try to do more for more people as our population grows and ages, uh, and the challenges around health human resources are what they are. I think uh, the Maple app, as it has been designed, uh, was essentially designed to try to have some type of level of service for those who can't access uh, uh, a family doctor or a walk-in clinic, for example, and as we build our collaborative of care centers, our neighborhoods and homes, uh, it, it has been filling a void, but I think uh, no good deed goes unpunished. I think it has become a situation where maybe some doctors have found it more profitable and easier to sit at home on the couch and diagnose patients than it would be to go to the office, etc. So I think there's significant challenges in how we move forward here. I think I, I would say quite honestly to the leader of the opposition, we want to exp our leader. You're still the leader. You're still the leader of the opposition to me. Uh, uh, the, um, <laughs> Uh, no, this is a serious issue, but uh, I really do think we want to try to use every bit of innovation and technology that we can in this changing and transformative time to deliver quality health care to islanders, but I also want to make sure that every islander knows that it is the intention of this government to do everything we can, uh, and we believe wholeheartedly in the model of public delivery of health care, and I think that's important. So we have to find our way through this. A long roundabout answer uh, to the leader of the third party to say, I take your point very seriously. I think it's a difficult situation we're finding ourselves in, and we're trying to work with all of our healthcare professionals to find our way through that uh, complicated situation. Thank you. Honourable Member for Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Madam Speaker, we know we need to build new housing, but we also need to protect our existing affordable housing. According to census data from 2016 to 2021, the island lost more than 1,800 rental households that paid less than $1,000 a month on housing. During the same time, the number of island households paying more than $1,500 a month increased by more than 2,100. My question for the minister is simple. Where has all our affordable housing gone? Yeah. Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, well, we continue to uh, add to our uh, to our uh, stock of social housing in this province through new builds, uh, through acquisitions, and uh, those are ongoing. We are planning for more. Uh, we know that the price of rental properties is rising across, uh, across the board in Prince Edward Island. Uh, accordingly, the thresholds for uh, being eligible for social housing uh, continue to rise as well. Um, so we know that uh, we need to continue adding to, uh, to our inventory, social housing throughout the province. Uh, we try to keep it affordable for those in need, for, for those most in need, and uh, we'll continue with those efforts to put people in homes that are, are, are affordable for them. Honourable member from Charlton, Victoria Park, for supplementary. Speaker, and there's all kinds of reasons why we're losing that affordable housing, and we should be tracking that. We could be tracking that, but your government's making a conscious decision not to. To preserve affordable housing, we can also look to jurisdictions like Montreal, which has used a first right of refusal to acquire affordable housing at market value and keep it out of the hands of speculators. The PEI Housing Corporation does not have a right of first, excuse me, first refusal which restricts its ability to acquire and maintain affordable housing. Will the minister institute a right of first refusal to maintain affordable housing stock? Honourable Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, we will take um, every opportunity to uh, acquire affordable housing when appropriate. Uh, I would note that acquiring properties that are not vacant does not add any net new units to our inventory. We have acquired properties in the past that, that are considered to be affordable units that may in fact be fully um, um, occupied, 
but we've taken that opportunity and we continue to, as, as uh, tenants leave those properties, we fill them with our clients. So that is one way to increase our inventory, but I would note that um, we have over 1,700 units of social housing in this, uh, in this province, and that continues to rise. Sorry? That continues to rise, and we'll continue to work on that uh, number uh, to increase our inventory. And that's an ongoing effort. It's a priority of this government, and it will continue to be. Honorable Member from Charlton, Victoria Park, your second supplementary. We just lost 1,800 units, so we know we need to build more. So whether we acquire them and they're full or not, it doesn't matter. This is, this is not just about our social program clients. This is about islanders having access to affordable housing. <laughs> The Green Party has asked this government to implement a rental registry numerous, 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 numerous times. This would protect tenants from illegal rents that put them further and further into debt. It would also give government a powerful tool. Don't you want more tools in your toolbox to monitor rents and PEI and ensure that housing is not becoming more and more unaffordable, which we're seeing now? Will the minister do the right thing and institute a rental registry, or will he let tenants continue to pay illegal rents? Mr. Housing, Land, and Communities. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I believe that no other provincial jurisdiction um, operates a registry for the purpose of tracking rents. Uh, the Commission did, um, our, the Department did commission a, a report from an independent consultant on the need for a rental registry and how it might uh, be implemented if, if, if it's required. We feel that we can accomplish the same uh, goal of a rental registry through our, our Residential Tenancy Act, and the Act does include a number of changes designed to help address the issue of rent increases. For example, identifying the previous tenant rent, rent rate on the lease, identifying in advance to the director units which require evictions in order to complete renovations, including three years of rent roll on applications for greater than allowable rent increases. And it also includes penalties for landlords that illegally raise the rent. So uh, there are measures in place to protect for in protections for this uh, for these cases. Honourable member from Tyne Valley Sherbrooke. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Healthcare is top of mind lately, especially in East Prince, as the PCH works through its current staffing challenges. We know that our emergency rooms are a pressure point for access to care. One thing that I believe could help support our frontline health care workers would be if we could better use nurse practitioners in our ERs. Question to the Premier. During the election, our party proposed adding nurse practitioner and physician assistants to help provide care to patients in emergency rooms like the one at the PCH. What is the status of this commitment? Honourable Premier. Uh, well, I want to thank the Honourable Member for uh, the question, and, and it is an important question. It was a key commitment in our platform uh, because uh, in talking with those on the front lines, uh, uh, there are <coughs> tools in the toolbox that we have within our system that can help alleviate some of the pressure points in the system, and uh, adding uh, individuals to help in the ER is one of those. So. Um, you know, we're working currently through the department and with Health PEI on how we would integrate nurse practitioners and physician assistants, not only into our emergency departments, but in other areas of the health system as well. Uh, we do recognize the value uh, and, and the, the role that those individuals can play. Uh, we do want the initiative to be successful. Uh, we will be consulting with nurses and nurse practitioners and other health professionals and staff in the ER to make sure we're doing this right. We're in the initial stages now, but as I've said many times in here, Honourable Member, uh, these uh, changes can't happen fast enough, and I hope we will work with urgency to get them implemented as quickly as possible. Honourable Member from Chine Valley, Sherbrooke, your first supplementary. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. I think this is a good idea, and it was one of my con one my constituents liked two at the doorstep. Anything we can do to strengthen our frontline health teams will benefit our entire health system. Question to the Premier. I get you might have answered it, but are the pieces in place to be able to move quickly on this, to getting this 
this in place within the system to improve access to care in our ERs at PCH. Honorable Premier. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And it is a, a really good question. And I think, in general, I would say the pieces are in place. Uh, but I also think we have learned uh, as a province over the last number of years, and even most recently uh, with the situation at PCH, which I know you're familiar with, is if you just make one decision based on one piece without dealing with the other aspects of the healthcare system, you realize it can cause some ripple effects down the road. So what I would again commit to saying here today is that we want to consult and work with all of those individuals uh, who, are, who can play a role here and to make sure when we implement this change uh, that we will, uh, we will have, be able to do so in such a way uh, that it will have the greatest impact positively on the system. Uh, member from Town Valley Sherbrooke, your second supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I was pleased to see an agreement reached in the new contract with our nurses. I'm hearing good feedback from it, from the nurses, and I understand it will help make our nurse practitioner wages very competitive. So question to the Premier, do you think that the combination of better wages and improved scope of practice for our nurse practitioners will make it easier for us to recruit and retain these valuable health professionals. Honorable Premier. Uh, that's uh, another great question. I would hesitate, based on my experience, to say any person in the healthcare system from a human resource situation or position is easy to recruit. I do think it makes it easier uh, for health PEI and the department and the system in general to attract individuals uh, from a professional basis if salary is at the level that it is at. I think we're at a very competitive level salary-wise. But if you talk to many on the front lines, and I know you have and I know others in this uh, house have done so, particularly during the election process, uh, is that wages aren't just the only thing that impact. It has to do with work-life balance. It has to do with the stressors that work and working in a safe environment and many, many things. But I do think uh, uh, while uh, the uh, financial situations of contracts tend to get a lot of the focus, I think if you talk to the head of the nurses union and the other executive members of their team, that a lot that was dealt with in this nurses contract aside from money are issues that you've been trying to deal with for a long time and I think that will help in the long run. But I would hesitate to say any recruitment in healthcare right now is easy. So thank you. I'm a member from Charlottetown Belvedere. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Our seniors are a very valuable part of our community, and we want them to thrive. One thing I've heard from seniors is about the importance of having access to technology. We heard yesterday from the finance minister about the Computers for Success program and what a great program that's being offered. Question to the Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Accessing Wi-Fi is a significant barrier for many living in seniors' housing. Do you know of any provincially owned seniors' housing facilities currently that have Wi-Fi for their residents? Oh, that's a great question. Honorable Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and thank you, uh, Honorable Member. I do not know that. Um, I, I, I can't say that I do. Um, I haven't, I visited seniors on my campaign walk and that was one thing we didn't talk about and it hasn't come up um, with the department since I've been there. We've been over many, many things, but Wi-Fi wasn't one of them. I do know that we do have uh, laptops available for seniors, um, but I don't know about the <laughs> Wi-Fi. So that's something I could definitely look into. Thank you. I remember from Charlottetown Belvedere, your first supplementary. Oh, that is great, and it's great to have computer access. It's not very good if they can't be connected. So, um, the reason I ask is that more and more we rely on technology to stay connected with friends and family these days. If our seniors living in public housing had access to Wi-Fi, say in like common rooms for example, then they would help bring neighbors together. It would help our seniors stay connected, which is a very good way to combat social isolation. On a personal note, staying connected with the ones I love through technology um, is invaluable for when I have children that don't live on PEI. So, question to the Minister of Social Development and Housing, or Social Development and Seniors. Has your department given any consideration to the feasibility and benefits 
of offering Wi-Fi access to seniors living in publicly owned housing. Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Yeah, thank you to Madam Speaker and thank you to the Honourable Member for the question. It's a wonderful idea and I will take that back and we will, I think we can probably do that if, if uh, that's out. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, just another point, and I'm excited to hear that you'll take back that and give some consideration. But I just wanted to mention too that tools like Maple to access healthcare services are important for our seniors to be able to um, be a part of, and um, it's just another tool. So um, I guess you've answered my question of whether you'd be, be committing to taking back. <laughs> So, could you commit to having your department look into this idea and adding Wi-Fi access into our publicly owned seniors' facilities and report back to the House? And thank you, Honourable Member, for the question. Consider that done. Honourable oh. <laughs> Member from... Honourable Member from Malaria and Brunettes. Since Mr. Speaker, I can't handle it anymore. <laughs> Madam Speaker, I appreciate the Minister of Workforce and Advanced Learning chairing two of the three leases involving skills PEI and CBS in all areas are requested earlier this week. Very informative documents, I might say. Can the Minister of Workforce and Advanced Learning explain why these two government agencies are spending an extra $201,648 plus expenses for heat and lights for this fiscal year uh, on basically nice offices in a resort municipality, Mr. Speaker, uh, and not putting it into uh, the skills to make people more employable and try to get these people uh, working. Our Minister of Workforce Advanced Learning and Population. Hello, member, and uh, I'm happy that he read through the leases that were shared. There was three. Um, uh, we made the decision uh, as a department and the staff that I trust to move that um, for better accessibility and visibility. Uh, and sometimes those decisions get made hard, uh, always for the best interest of the Islanders and the clients we're serving, which is over 800 in West Prince. Um, so we are doing it for, for those folks uh, to ensure they have accessibility to those services. Thank you. Honorable member from Elyria and Madam Speaker, the problem is, is we're putting money into nice, nice, beautiful offices in a resort uh, location, Mr. Speaker, or Madam Speaker, and uh, we're not putting it into the people that uh, need the training and, and have the skills. So, uh, but on top of this, Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, they're also uh, spending another uh, 28000 because they had a lease two facilities. They're going to have two facilities. So they're going to have one that where they're currently at leased for another year, and then they have the new facility. Currently, so I'm just kind of wondering what what does the minister have in, in plan for uh, these empty spaces? Because one of these places are going to be empty, uh, and what are you going to do with those uh, one of those spaces? Minister. Minister of Workforce Advanced Learning and Population. Madam Speaker, and thank you, Honourable Member. Um, and I have uh, been in conversation to understand that there are other government um, offices staff that will be using that space. Um, we did, uh, did allow us to give us a little bit of cushion time to make the move, but they will be moving in to fill that space. Thank you. Curiosity is peak now. <laughs> but that, that might change. That, that changes the water and the beans, as the saying goes, uh, Madam Speaker. So anyway, uh, could you maybe give the, our community in Nolari a little bit of a hint on what these uh, great new uh, staffing, because I'm hoping it will replace 1,000 people that come to the community on an annual basis, as well as 15 staff. Honourable Minister of Workforce, Advanced Learning and Population. Um, and I, I don't have the exact departments. It does fall under another um, minister's responsibility, but I am happy to say that there are is other staff moving into that space. Before we go any further, I'm just going to try and nip this in the bud right away. A lot of long preambles, a lot of long answers today. So we try and keep within the, the time frame. We were close, but I let us go over a little bit. I'm going to try and run a tight ship here. So I know you all like to hear yourselves talk, but let's try and uh, <laughs> let's try and limit it a little bit so we stay within the parameters. And uh, also uh, just to, met, to remind everyone, and maybe some of the new members don't know, please do not mention people being absent from the House. I know the Honourable Premier did that because 
we have a member who is going to be out for a long time. But it's just something we don't do on a regular basis, or at all. So please just remember to uh, to not do that. And I'll try and continue to uh, make sure we all do what we're supposed to in here. Thank you. <laughs> Statements by ministers, uh, starting with the Honourable Minister of Social Development and Seniors. Thank you. Madam Speaker, thank you. I'm honoured to stand today to recognise the importance of work, the work of foster families in PEI. Madam Speaker, from experience, I know that being a mother and a grandmother takes a great deal of commitment, time and compassion. But Madam Speaker, the time, commitment and compassion that these foster families show is second to none. We have some foster families in the gallery with us today, and I can't help but feel overwhelmed with gratitude for the service and support you provide to island children and youth who need it the most. Every child needs someone to love them, encourage them, support them. Sadly, some children have parents that may not be able to do that now for various reasons. For fo foster families provide much more than four walls and a roof to children and youth. They are the teachers, they are the mentors, and they are the guides. They show up wholeheartedly and honestly, and they provide children with a safe home, comfort and routine, and most importantly, love, which truly makes a difference in their lives. To the foster families with us today, I can say, I know this is not easy. Some of the children you welcome into your home are hurt emotionally and physically, and you feel their pain with them. The role of being a foster parent can be challenging, but is so very, very important. I am eager to work together with foster families to make sure that they have the support they need to give children a welcoming and safe environment. I invite all members of the House to promote foster care opportunities across PEI, and I encourage all Islanders who are interested in making a difference in the life of a child or a youth in need, a youth in need to visit fosterparents.princeedwardisland.ca. Thank you to the foster parents, and thank you, Madam Speaker. Charlton West Royalty. Yeah, I'd like to thank the minister for that uh, that great statement today. I think um, you know it's it's important that that you did that and, and recognize that. And, and over the, the a number of years, um, we've often talked about um, fostering and 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 that. And I, I think it's something that that does not that we take the politics out of it, and we all just want to support and love just like you love a child, no matter what. And, and, and you welcome them into your home at the time they need them the most, and you provide them a chance to, to live a life that they deserve. And I just want to say thank you very much. There's a lot of families all are made up of different situations at different times in their, in their lives, and they need a help, and we need, need to, we need to be there for your organization. And I want to thank the minister for that, and, and I'll continue to support on this side. Along, we'll work along with the minister to see whatever we can do, and I'll, I'll, I'll push her gently to, to, to continue good work. So thank you for coming today. Thank you, Minister of the State. The Honourable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for, for the statement, and welcome to the foster families that we have here with us today. Um, they do crucial, important work in our province, dealing with some of our most traumatized or vulnerable children who are in really awful circumstances when you consider why they wouldn't be able to stay with their families. And so having people here who are ready and open with their open arms is a service that I don't think we can even appreciate enough or understand deeply enough to to show the appreciation and gratitude that, that we need to. I know in talking with several foster families over the years that they have their challenges and and they're, you know, anytime, I, I know that the minister is new in this role, so I'm sure just kind of getting her feet under her, but I look forward to, to her hearing some more of the challenges that they deal with. Um, you know, hearing people say that, 
they've got foster children who have been through very traumatic events and there's no counseling available for the children, which is a huge disservice to the children and to their health, to a healthy future, the, their chance at a healthy future. We have to align. This isn't directly related to foster parents, but it is because they're the ones dealing with it. We have to align our child protection legislation with our Adoption Act because those two things bunt heads and we need to do a severe review of those two to ensure that they work together. This is about the kids who are accessing the services of foster families and they are at the center of this. If we don't align those two, act, those two acts, this will never get be a better system. And so I really highly encourage you to look at that. Um, when we consider the importance of families like this and we consider the fact that the numbers of, the, of families who are offering foster care support are dwindling, we also need to look at that. I think that in doing a review of the two acts, maybe we would be able to find some common ground and, and get some folks back or to get to encourage new people to become foster families. But if we don't fix some of these big problems, we're going to keep losing foster families. And I leave everyone with the question, if we don't have foster families, who looks after these children? Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honourable Minister of Economic Development, Innovation and Trade. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise for my first minister's statement in this House. So it's a pleasure for me to rise today to encourage island entrepreneurs to submit an application to the Ignition Fund. This fund has been an important part of many island businesses' journey to help them turn their ideas into realities. The Ignition Fund is run by Innovation PEI and accepts applications twice a year, in the spring and in the fall. The deadline for spring is fast approaching, May 24th to be exact. It's a competitive process, but one that's quite worthwhile because those selected can receive up to $25,000 in seed money. For someone just starting out, whether it's a brand new business or a new innovative product that they want to get to the market, this type of financial support can make all the difference. We all know that island residents have always had a strong entrepreneurial spirit. I'm incredibly proud to know that island businesses can count on Innovation PEI to help them grow, helping them turn, turn ideas into realities, and helping them reach new heights. So Madam Speaker, with the deadline fast approaching, I would say to anyone who has a fresh idea not to hesitate. Reach out to our Innovation PEI business development officers and let's get you started. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Someone responding? Honorable member from O'Leary and Verness. I'd just like to stand up and say that it's important to get to get businesses to, to participate. Uh, I want to thank the minister for that that statement and it's uh, Really, um, it's an opportunity for Islanders to, to participate and, and make sure they get uh, get all their paperwork in. And because there's some, there's some, this is a good program. And I'd like to thank the minister for bringing that forward. Merci beaucoup. On doit parler français un petit peu la prochaine fois. Okay, merci. Thank you. Honourable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, Minister. A very welcome announcement. Of course, I've watched a number of now successful island businesses be launched through this Ignition Fund. And $25,000 for a new entrepreneur here on Prince Edward Island is a substantial amount of money. And in the economic environment in which we find ourselves now, young people, and I don't want to assume that everybody that will come forward for the Ignition Fund is a young entrepreneur, they're a new entrepreneur, and I know that's part of the criteria but they could be of any age. But the majority of the ones that I know that have gone through this program are indeed young entrepreneurs. Very difficult to establish capital these days, whether that's saving money or whether it's getting loans from a bank. So government coming forward and providing an opportunity for young entrepreneurs here on Prince Edward Island, of which there are many, uh, access to that kind of money is, is literally the difference between them making it and not making it. It's a wonderful program. I thank you for the announcement that the deadline is coming. I shall think of those in my own district and beyond who would be appropriate to, to make application for this. I know many who have done it before. It's a great program, and again, it gives that launch. The Ignition Fund gives the launch to so many good businesses here on Prince Edward Island, and I thank the Minister for the opportunity for young entrepreneurs, young, aged, old, whatever you are, 
to, to uh, access this fund. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Presenting and receiving petitions. Uh, tabling of documents. <coughs> Honourable uh, member from Charlottetown West Royalty. Madam Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg to leave at the table uh, a CBC article, Women Staying Longer at PEI <laughs> Shelters Because There's Nowhere Else to Go, and I move seconded by the Leader of the Opposition that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall carry. Carry. Madam <clears throat> Speaker, by leave of the House, I beg to leave the table um, a document by Executive Council showing that the Minister of Social Development is not is not on the, the, the committee, but we do have um, we do have the Minister of, of uh, Climate Change and Energy on the, on the Housing Committee. So uh, I'm not sure uh, what, what's why, but anyway. Um, and I move seconded by the Leader of the Opposition that the said document be now received and uh, do lie on the table. Honourable our Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table uh, a report uh, that I cited in question period today. It's, uh, it's a media report entitled, Do Private For-Profit Clinics Save Taxpayers Money and Reduce Wait Times? Question mark. The data says no. And I move seconded by the member from Ch Charlottetown, Victoria Park, that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. So I'll carry. Honourable <coughs> Member from Charlton Victoria Park. Thank you, Madam Speaker. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table a CBC story called City of Montreal to Exercise Right of Re First Refusal to Turn Properties for Sale into Social Housing. And I move seconded by the Leader of the Third Party that the said document be now received and do lie on the table. Shall carry. carry. Honourable Member from Charlton Victoria Park. By leave of the House, I beg leave to table data about the loss of affordable housing and PEI, and I move seconded by the Leader of the Third Party that the said document be received and do lie on the table. Shall I carry? Honourable Members, pursuant to Section 30 of the Child and Youth Advocate Act, I wish to advise that I have received the Child and Youth Advocate's annual report for the year ending March 31st, 2022. I move that the report be received and do now lie on the table. Shall I carry? Reports by committees. Honourable Member from, or from Kensington Malpeck. Um, Madam Speaker, as Chair of the Special Committee on Committees, I beg leave to introduce the first report of the said committee entitled Composition of the Standing Committees. I move second by the Honourable Member from Charlottetown Winslow that the report be now received and do lie on the table. Madam Speaker. Shall it carry? <laughs> Honourable Member. Madam Speaker. Uh, pursuant to Rule 110.5 of the Rules of the Legislative Assembly, I'll be moving the motion for adoption of the report tomorrow, Friday, May 19th. Okay. Uh, introduction of government bills, government motions. Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, and uh, Deputy Premier. Madam Speaker, I move. Seconded by the Minister of Fisheries and Parks and Rec, that the uh, first order of the day be now read. Shall I carry? Order number one, consideration of the speech of Her Honor, the Lieutenant Governor, at the opening of the present session. The debate was adjourned by the Honorable Leader of the Third Party. Honorable Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise again and conclude my remarks uh, on the speech from the throne. I think if I was to characterize the four years of this government's tenure, uh, it would be one of broken promises and missed opportunities. Um, broken promises, of course, right from day one to the, to the final day before the election. Shovels in the ground, I mean, the, the sort of mother of all broken promises, right up to we are, we will stick with the fixed election date. The Premier said that repeatedly for years and years and years, and then, of course, we ended up in a spring election. Broken promises from the first day to the last day in office. Missed opportunities, my goodness, so many, too many to count, really, but opportunities to deal with the issues that impact islanders' lives every single day, whether that's access to health care, whether it's affordability and accessibility to housing, 
whether it is the cost of living that was discussed in question period today or the protection of our environment or so many other issues, missed opportunities by a government to take action, bring forward policies and legislation and put money where it was needed to solve these problems. And of course, it's not just about money. Money is important in solving many of our issues and the housing issue that we discussed today at length and question period is absolutely something that requires public money. However, money does not solve all problems. And particularly in a situation, and I listened to, to uh, Danielle Steele, who's, uh, Danielle Smith, excuse me, who's in the midst of an election in Alberta right now, talk about how her government has spent more money on health care than, than any preceding Alberta government. But the measure of whether your health system is getting better or not is not how much money you spend on it, it's, it's whether you're getting results. And good government, thank you, good government is not about how much money you spend, it's about whether or not you're reaching your goals, whether you are measuring the results that you get and, get and, and seeing improvements. And when it comes to health care, are, are Islanders seeing better access to health care? Well, the obvious answer to that is no, despite the proclamations of the Premier during the election that uh, health care has never been better on this province. I have no idea what metric he was using to make that statement. But there is nothing, there are no measures by which you can say that our health care system overall, there may be corners of it that have improved, but that our healthcare system overall is better. We need results-based management. We need to know that Islanders are getting value for their tax dollars, and at the moment they're not. And we need to measure things like, again, access to care. We need to measure things like wait times for surgeries and wait times for getting results of your, of your test, getting tests done and getting results back. We need to measure outcomes of procedures. And if all of those are heading in the di right direction, then the Premier can stand up and say with confidence and with evidence behind him that things have never been better in the healthcare system. But at the moment, that's not true. So that's one area where we're not failing. We're not, we're not measuring. And there are other things which are perhaps more difficult to measure. They're more ephemeral. Things like the morale in our healthcare system. And those of us who have received um, really poignant messages from nurses over the last little while, particularly the ICU, ICU nurses at, at the Prince County Hospital, will tell you that morale is not good. Our frontline healthcare staff do not feel valued or respected. And while you cannot perhaps measure that in the same way that you can measure the days before you will have cataract surgery or a hip transplant or whatever you're waiting for, you can certainly see signs, very indisputable signs around this province that morale within the, the workforce is not good. And that obviously has a direct impact on the quality of care that Islanders are receiving. So it's not about how much money we spend, it's about getting better results for Islanders. More money being spent with worse results is bad government. And we need a government that that manages itself not, not by saying how much money we're spending on any particular issue, but says we are making progress here. And I can show you that by saying that five years ago this was happening, today this is happening, and that's a clear indication that we're getting the results that we want. And unfortunately we do not have that kind of data here on Prince Edward Island. That's true for housing as well. We have very sparse data when it comes to housing on Prince Edward Island. Uh, the, the member from Charlottetown, uh, thank you, <coughs> West Royalty, asked a question today about the number of homeless people here on Prince Edward Island. I don't think we know that number. I have never found it. I don't know whether there is data that could actually, reliable data that we could stand up, the minister could stand up, or the person asking the question could provide that. I don't know. That's just one example of areas where we have sparse data on housing here on Prince Edward Island. But what we do know is that vacancy rates are terribly low. We do know that we are falling behind in the number of units that we have to be building. We need to build 2,000 new units every year, 500 units a quarter. And we're not even close to that. So our housing things are getting worse. So that's an area where we can say we're not getting the results we want. Things are getting worse. And in that case, government does need to spend more money. I have, no, I, I, I have no issue at all with government coming forward with a significant capital um, investment to improve the housing situation here on Prince Edward Island. 
We also need to support local landlords. We need stronger regulation when it comes to things like short-term rentals and when it comes to things like the tax breaks that the real estate investment trusts, trusts are given. Real estate investment trusts, trusts or REITs are given tremendous tax breaks. These are, these are the corporations which own multiple, multiple, multiple units, um, typically of, of rental properties. And they pay much less tax here in our province than do, let, for example, a small landlord who may rent out their basement or may have a, a part of their house which is converted into an apartment that they rent out. They are taxed much more heavily than the people who own the corporations for real estate investment trusts. We are making it easier for those who live off island and are, are profiting on the backs of islanders than we are for landlords here on Prince Edward Island who are providing an immensely important service of providing housing for islanders. We absolutely need to take a look at that and make sure that the tax system that we have is encouraging the behaviour that we want and providing the housing that islanders need. It's just one, one example of how government has tools in its toolbox, as my honourable friend from Charlottetown, Victoria Park, said earlier today, to nudge things in the direction that we want. I've, I've spoken at length now about about some of the major issues here on Prince Edward Island. And we have indeed some very large concerns before us. Um, government, to a large extent, is about succession planning. It's about leaving things better when we are done than they were before we got here, with the, than we found them. And over the last four years, I mean, I've just talked about health and housing there, but I, I could bring forward any number of other issues. Things are not better. Things are heading in the wrong direction. And for me, there is nothing in this speech from the throne that gives me confidence that despite this government's proclamation that this is our time, which is one of the, one of the sections of the speech from the throne, that this government is actually capable of meeting that challenge or facing that responsibility of, of, of being the right government for this moment. And that's of great concern for me. Islanders deserve a government that not only cares about them and, and the numerous challenges that we're facing, but one that has a clear, a clear and decisive plan for the island now and for a long time into the future, a vision for the future of this island. And this plan and the government I believe are failing to meet this, this and I, I worry that islanders will have to live with the consequences of that. I really appreciate the opportunity to stand up uh, in this house and speak to the, the speech from the throne. And I also really look forward to hearing from others. Um, this is perhaps the one and only opportunity that we get as members of this house to talk about the full spectrum of government activity and possibility. Um, of course, we delve down into all sorts of, of uh, minutia on in particular parts of governance. But if you want to look at high level of how government runs and the vision and the way forward for government, this is the opportunity that you have as a member of this house to stand up and say, whether you think there are challenges and concerns with the speech from the throne, or to cheer it on and suggest that this is exactly what this province needs. So I really look forward to members of this House expressing uh, whether it's their concern or whether it's their excitement about this document and what it says about this government and what that means for islanders. So Madam Speaker, let us tackle all of these issues, large and small, with sharp and open minds and a generosity of spirit that is worthy of the people that we serve and of this special <coughs> island that we call home. Thank you, Madam Speaker. <coughs> Honourable Member from Rustico Emerald. Uh, yes. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure to stand and, uh, and respond to the speech from the throne. Um, it, it's, I find it is, uh, it is a very good document that um, 
although very high level, uh, does contain a great vision for where this government wants to go. And I'm generally very happy with the speech from the throne. Um, what I'd like to do, Madam Speaker, is go through uh, the input that I prepared before the, I saw the speech from the throne and just talk about uh, all of the things that the constituents District 18 Russell Emerald brought to me when I knocked door to door. Um, I really do like the fact that this government, um, for the first time ever, uh, starting with our mandate last term, actually asked all MLAs, including all opposition MLAs, for input to the speech from the throne, to all budgets, to really give people a chance to ask for things that, were, that they were hearing at the doors. And I took that very, very seriously, Madam Speaker. And I don't know, I wrote a few thousand words at least here that I submitted as my input to the speech from the throne. So I, I, won't, I won't go through it line by line, but I do have a, a I, wanted, I wanted to highlight the pieces that, um, that I thought were missing. So Madam Speaker, um, I want to go back just uh, as, a, as a point of recall uh, to 2011 when I first ran for office and uh, I was listening of course being the uh, the tech guy I was even back in 2011 I recorded my uh, my nomination speech and I posted it to YouTube and there's a much younger looking version of me looking back there with a lot more hair no, no glasses <laughs> and um, and one of the things that uh, I talked about in that nomination speech were problems with health care and Madam Speaker, guess what the number two, the number one and two problems were with health care in the province back in 2011, according to a young aspiring politician. Wait times in emergency departments and lack of family doctors. So here we are, 12 years later, and guess what the number one problems are going around District 18, at least in the here province. Uh, wait times in emergency departments and... Uh, lack of family doctors. So what I'm really proud to see and very pleased to see in the speech from the throne um, in particular is the patient medical home neighbor medical home model to to turn the idea of a family doctor on its head. I mean it's been talked about a lot but I think it bears worth repeating. Um, and this is something I talked about at almost every single door and people said what are these patient medical homes what's going on and the whole idea is what I told people, and I hope this is exactly the way it'll work. You don't ever make an appointment to see your doctor. You make an appointment to see your medical team. And I've since heard the new Minister of Health and Wellness talk about the inverted pyramid. So what you do is you start at the top and you see your medical team. And it's only if your problem can't get solved is you funnel down to your family doctor. I think this is a great model. It's an important model. It's been a long time in coming. And... Um, of course, the big thing along with that model is making sure that, A, we have the, the space and the equipment and the staff for our, our medical homes. I say A, the space, equipment, B, the staff. Um, so, Madam Speaker, this is the challenge, and I want to urge um, the Minister of Health and Wellness and, and the government as a whole, um, as they go through this process, to build these patient medical homes. Again, the promise was by the end of 2024 or by the beginning of 2025, is to make sure they communicate with communities about what the status of the patient medical homes are. Um, and in particular with the MLAs because it's something that people want to know. They want to know the status. It's about being open, it's about being transparent and working together with our communities to build these patient medical homes. And, and it's something um, I know uh, the two that would impact my district the most are, would be a patient medical home in Hunter River, which would of course be shared uh, with much of the, the Premier's district, and a uh, patient medical home in North Rustico. Uh, in particular, uh, in North Rustico, there's the uh, Gulf Shore Communities Health Organization that has been lobbying for almost 20 years uh, for clinics and now a patient medical home and wanting to see that happen. They've met with the minister and um, I'm waiting right now, Madam Speaker, for a status of where we're at. We've got at least two developers who want to offer space for a patient medical home. And so uh, as, as things progress, and I, I realize it may take time, but first of all, let's move with a sense of urgency. Secondly, let's make sure we communicate the progress. This is not about um, 
cloak and dagger. This is not about secrets. This is about communicating with constituents to bring our promises to fulfillment that we made during the election. So that's what I'm looking for. The other, the other prong, and this is why I mentioned my nomination speech as well, is in that nomination speech, so this is back 12 years ago. Um, I've mentioned many times in this house, I come from an information systems background. I'm looking across at the Minister of Housing, Land and Communities. I know he's an information systems guy as well. I think there may be some others around in this house too. But way back then, this was kind of the infancy of the, the internet and social media. I remember um, the CBC did a big story about how social media could be used in an election in 2011. And it was Doug Curry and I were interviewed to look at our our uh, use of social media and back then it was using a digital camera not a phone to take your video then you had to take that and somehow upload it to the internet uh, and YouTube was around and so that's what I used but uh, the reason I bring that up is I saw a huge opportunity at the time for virtual health care or telemedicine and in fact I talked about it at length in that nomination speech and uh, here we are 12 years later, and really, Madam Speaker, this is the surprising part, we're just barely, barely scratching the surface of what I think can be accomplished through virtual health care. I think that the, uh, the approach that we heard earlier today from the, uh, the third party is, uh, is, really, uh, is really narrow in thinking, this idea that all solutions have to be public and we can't use private solutions. I think we have to use private solutions. I think it's, it's going to be faster, it's going to be better, it's going to be cheaper and more efficient. But uh, Madam Speaker, there's no reason why we're just using video chat and text right now to do virtual health care. We have high speed internet. Um, continuous improvements uh, are happening and maybe some more improvements are required, but there's no reason why you couldn't have an otoscope with a high definition image that allows that doctor at the other end to literally see a high definition image of, of inside your ear, inside your mouth, the back of your throat, inside your nose. That's what I proposed back in 2011. There's no reason why they couldn't see your vital signs through, through whatever equipment was hooked up to you to monitor your blood pressure, your, your heart rate. And, and Madam Speaker, there's no reason why this couldn't happen in almost every single community across Prince Edward Island. There's a pharmacy uh, in almost every community across the island, and those pharmacies, all they would need is a small room with somebody that had a little bit of medical knowledge and a little bit of, of uh, information systems expertise, and someone could go there, the equipment could be there, and it would allow for true virtual health care remotely. And this is not, as, as the, uh, I think it was the third party said, about doctors being taken away from providing in-person care because they're providing virtual care. Maybe that is happening in a couple of cases. But I think it would be more efficient for everybody. It's more efficient for, for the medical staff. It's more efficient for the patients. And in fact, Madam Speaker, when I was going door to door to door, every household brought up health care. And every household I said, have you tried maple? And Madam Speaker, I would say over half the households have tried maple. And you know, probably about 90% of those liked maple. They said it worked very well for them and they were overjoyed to use it. In fact, although it was a huge problem and a legitimate problem that maple cost $70 if you weren't on the patient registry, um, there were people out there that were happy to pay $70, especially, Madam Speaker, young families who had three kids, they had to leave their job, they had a, a child with an earache, and they didn't have the time to go and sit for hours in an emergency or, or, or take, roll the dice get into a clinic. So they paid the $70, they used Maple, they got help they needed right away, and they got the prescription they needed to help their child, and they did it in a very efficient fashion. So I, I think, if anything, I would have liked to see the speech from the throne a little stronger on this point. It, it does mention it, um, but we need to focus I believe on what uh, on the future of what healthcare delivery is going to be, and, and I think virtual healthcare will just be a commonplace thing in the future. Um, we'll have health professionals working from home to provide it. We'll have people accessing it from home or from central spots in the community that have the proper equipment needed to allow true virtual health care. And I would urge the Minister of Health, who is actually uh, from an information systems background as well, to pursue this, to pilot a project as soon as possible 
to, to take advantage of some of this uh, next level virtual health care. Um, the other thing uh, that really surprised me, Madam Speaker, when I knocked on door to door and uh, people brought up health care as an issue, I said, what, 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 is your, what are your concerns? They say, well, health care is my number, number one concern. And I'd say, well, what is it about health care that is your issue? How is, how is the, your health care service? Are your health care needs being looked after? And you know, Madam Speaker, I would say at least, you know, 48 or 49 out of 50 people would say, I'm okay. I'm looked after. I have a family doctor. I've found a way to make it work for me. I'm using maple and that's good enough. That, but then, you know what they would say, Madam Speaker, they say, what I'm really worried about are our staff in health care. Because they said, I have a, a sister, a brother, a friend who's a social worker, who's an RCW, who's an LPN, who's an RN, who's a doctor, who's a respiratory therapist. And they're saying they are stressed to the max, they feel overworked, they feel underpaid and underappreciated. And um, I, I, I'm not sure if we explicitly mentioned that in the speech from the throne, but it's, it's the soft issues of management that are the problem. And I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Uh, you know, morale is low. And um, you know, one of the problems was, you know, nurses were up in arms, of course, because their contract hadn't been finalized after two years. Fantastic news that it looks like we're going to uh, have an agreement very, very soon. Um, and of course, there was the problem that was mentioned by others where bonuses were paid to some workers but not others. I, I had constituents work in cleaning services at the PCH, and that really bo bothered them. They kind of took it in stride, but they said, look, why should they get bonuses when I'm just as important to the system as anybody else? So we need to focus on that, that team model, which I think we're going to do, but let's make sure that includes everybody on the team because everybody is part of that, uh, that health professional team. And um, in speci specifically, I, ha I have a lot of constituents that work at the Prince County Hospital. And now what we've seen, that is a major topic of concern right now with the two internists leaving, which of course happened during the election, but also uh, um, nurses looking down the pipe and saying, with those internists gone, what are we going to do about the ICU? If we lose our ICU, we're going to lose our hospital, and this is going to impact the province as a whole. Well, I, I talked to them at length. I talked to nurses, social workers, respiratory therapists, jan janitorial staff, and everyone pointed to that problem at the end of the day. There was a lot of discussion, but it was poor management of what they said at the end of the day. Um, I had one person say that their director, quote, um, sits with their feet up on his desk, and I told the person, it's not my, it's not my job to make you like me. This is the way things are going to be, and you go back and do your job. And, but, but they didn't blame the supervisor for that attitude, Madam Speaker. They said the supervisors, the management, is under just as much pressure as them because of the staffing ratios. You're a manager or a director, you've got a, a 100 to 1 ratio of the people you're supposed to manage. Um, so we need a real, real shakeup in management in health PEI. Uh, I'm not going to say I, I have the answer to what that actually means, but uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm hoping the things we're hearing from Dr. Gardam are pointing towards this, but um, we need we need a shakeup. And I I think um, one of the things that every single healthcare professional said is, this is so refreshing to have someone coming and asking me what I think the problems are and how I think they can be solved. And again, this is nothing new, Madam Speaker. But somehow we got away from that. And it's up it's up to you ministers over there, I firmly believe it as well, whatever your portfolio is, to go down and sit with the frontline workers and say, hey, how can I help you do your job better? And then feed that back into your, your senior staff and say, this is what I'm hearing on the front line. I want, you to, I want you to fix these problems. It's easier said than done, believe me. I sat in those shoes and I tried to do it, and it's tough. And in fact, um, it was a senior administrator who told me that when I ran in 2011, that was a good approach. And it was former minister Jamie Ball who used to do that when he was Minister of Health. And he would go in and he would actually book a room in the hospital and he'd say, I'm here for the day, you come down, you talk to me, you tell me what your problems are. So I would encourage this government and you ministers, whoever you are, to do that. 
And I know the former Minister of Health, um, when I, I fed in problems that from constituents I talked to, like nurses, he said, you know what, if you want me to meet with them, I will meet with them, and that's what we need. If there's anything I regret from my time as Minister is that I didn't spend enough time meeting with people one-on-one. -on -one. I know the member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park, uh, often had a, a lineup of people for me to meet, where, meet with. And, and I said, you know, I have other people who are experts that are better for them to meet with, but you know what, I regret that. Because I, I think it's important for ministers to, to hear people from people firsthand on the front line. And then let their, their operational experts take the problems they hear and solve them. Um, one thing, uh, and this gets maybe a little too much into the operational details, but um, in particular when it comes to RCWs and nurses, both LPNs and, RP and RNs, there's people, the nurses who are switching from full-time positions to casual positions, and I think most of us in here would have heard that, because they want to be able to choose the time when they work. When they're full-time, they're scheduled in, and that's what the schedule is, and you ask for time off, you're told no, and you work harder. If you're casual, you just say, no, I'm not available to work, and they say, okay, they move on to the next person on the casual list. And they're doing that so they can manage their own work-life balance. And um, I don't know what the answer is to that problem, but that's one that really needs to be looked at by uh, Health PEI. Um, in fact, the full-time people often uh, feel compelled to pick up the... Uh, the shifts and the, the vacancies that are left open when casual staff aren't available because they care so much about their job. I, I talked to an RCW that works at a long-term care facility and that, that's exactly the position she was in. She was working full time, but she knew all of the people in the long-term care facility and she knew if she didn't step up and take that shift and they were down people, those, they were gonna suffer. We, we heard about that the other day in the motion talk about long-term care. And it really is about staffing shortages. It's not about, um, uh, about the care that, uh, that people want to provide. Now, the other thing that I heard, and I think it's important to bring this up, um, is that so-called uh, travel nurses are coming in at higher rates of pay and this is causing morale issues. Now, hopefully the new nurses contract will help sol solve that as well. And I'm not saying these are easy issues, but they're ones that really need to be worked on and solved. Um, I had one, it was, a, it was a fellow who had worked for almost 40 years in the healthcare system as a respiratory therapist. And he said, right now we don't need people from Department of Health and Wellness, we don't need people from Health PEI uh, coming in to try and, and, and solve these problems. He said, you really know, need to go to a third party um, from outside of Prince Edward Island. I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking like a management consulting firm that specializes in health and have them come and talk to frontline employees, document what they heard and make recommendations back. Now, maybe this has been done in the past. I, I'm looking across at the former Minister of Health. I don't know of a report if that, if that sort of approach has been taken in the past, and maybe it has, but, but um, I think that would go a long ways to allowing executive uh, branch of government to hold health PEI to account if they had that recommendations report and say, this is what we're hearing from a third party source. What are you gonna do to meet those recommendations? Kind of like the audit, when the Auditor uh, General comes forward with their reports and then says, departments, this is what you need to change because there's problems here. Um, and I actually wrote this down in my notes as well. It says, I could go on and on about the various specific issues because there are many and varied and that's true. It's, um, I, I heard about nurses leaving their profession to go work at the Summerside Tax Center because they felt even given the decrease in pay, it was the, the peace of mind was much better. Um, I heard about, uh, you know, the people were not being made uh, aware enough about what palliative care services offered. And so, in fact, they felt, this person, that sometimes the, uh, the maid services, the medically assisted uh, uh, death services, were, were sometimes being chosen in error. That's a huge topic. Um, I, heard, I heard about healthcare workers that said the unions were telling them not to speak out, even though the unions are telling us that, no, no problem, anyone can say what they want. But then I also heard a healthcare worker recently tell me that, in fact, it's not a problem with, with unionized workers speaking out because they're protected by the union. It's a problem with management not being able to speak out because they're excluded positions. And if they speak out, their head's on the chopping block. So we got, we got a, we've got organizational management, operational management issues to, to, to deal with. And this is where maybe the Board of Health PEI 
can can work to help solve those challenges. And uh, maybe this is them that need need to do that. But perhaps as an executive council, uh, it's pushing the board of health PEI to come up with solutions to these problems and report back. Um, I should mention that Derek Key is my constituent, the uh, the former chair of health PEI. Um, in fact, I haven't talked to him specifically about his experience and why. I reached out to him, um, but we haven't connected on that issue, which may be, may be just as well, honestly, at this point. Um, ignorance is bliss sometimes, they say. But uh, I hope to connect with him at some point in the future. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, so anyway, uh, the, the underlying this whole thing, uh, to summarize perhaps, patient medical homes and neighborhoods, A plus idea, let's get it done quickly, let's communicate on the status, B, let's work really hard to expand virtual health care and go to the next level, we can do it, and, and, and C, let's listen to frontline health care workers, hire an outside firm if we need to, to get that report and make the recommendations. So that's, there you go, that's, that's health and wellness. And that's the, that's the first part I wanted to talk about in my response to the speech from the throne. Now, the next thing I'll talk about uh, actually is not health but wellness. And now when I was going around door to door, every once in a while, you know, I would say, uh, you know, about one out of a hundred doors, um, they wanted, they wanted to hear, you know, what I, what I wanted to do, Madam Speaker, when it came to government. Most people really just want to talk about their issues, make sure you know what they are so that you can represent them and fight for them. But uh, sometimes, and I said, um, Madam Speaker, the, the, the three topics that I really wanted to push for, I, I had an inkling I might be, I might be on the government backbench coming in, coming in here, and I am. But I said, if I am, the three that I really want to push for are, are wellness, <laughs> because we spend, really it's a small percentage of our budget, our health and wellness budget on wellness. And I'll talk a little bit about what I think that means. And land use planning, and I know the Minister of Housing, Land and Communities, we already met, and land use planning is, is high on his list. And energy, so the Minister responsible for energy, that's something as well that I really want to push for. I know he's looking forward to me pushing him on that file because I think he's got some good answers, or he thinks he's got some good answers I anyway. Yes. <laughs> so, I want to talk first about wellness. Um, now, wellness, like climate change, um, really spans multiple uh, government departments. And uh, government silos really is a problem that we need to continue breaking down. This came up on Monday night at our climate change adaptation talk, and everybody agreed that climate change is making some progress in breaking down the silos. But uh, the ministers across there, whenever you get a chance, to interact with other departments, that's good. Now, the, the special uh, special cabinet committee on housing, I actually started a special cabinet committee on housing when I was housing minister as well. It had limited success. I think, um, I'm hoping that this one does better. Uh, we got a nice strong minister, but I think the key thing is, is the premier has to be driving that and making sure that he's telling his people in the premier's office this is the priority and I want to hear reports back. But. Um, I think a uh, cabinet committee on wellness or something along those nature, because it's cross-departmental, is, is what is needed. Um, wellness often falls to the chief public health office, believe it or not. They're the ones who are kind of responsible for that area. And I remember, uh, really, it, be, it became a marketing exercise, you know. People, you got to be well. Here's why you got to be well. We got to educate you, be well, be exercise, eat good foods. But it's, wellness is about much more than that. Um, I think we need to discuss it more. I think in particular mental well-being is an area of concern. We've already heard that from multiple people that the speech from the throne was a little light on the mental health side of things and mental well-being. Um, but let's talk about what that means in the, in the context of wellness. Um, so one initiative that is really good from government is the PEI Alliance for Mental Well-Being. And I think it's making a real difference. It's still a fledgling organization. Um, I've always been a, a big fan of letting existing organizations thrive by giving them support and funding. And I, I like service organizations, everything from religious ones like Knights of Columbus, Catholic, Catholic Women's League, uh, United Church Women, United Church Men, right through the, the Lions Clubs, the, the Kiwanis, 
and, and organizations like that because they do so much with such a little bit of money. And uh, I wanted to highlight, Madam Speaker, that the Hunter River Lions Club celebrated their 50th anniversary of becoming a charter member organization last Friday. I was able to attend and speak. And it's absolutely incredible the work that they do and the people in the community that give their time to help their community. And I know for a fact that as an MLA, when there's gaps in government services, I go to the Lions Clubs, for example, and other Knights of Columbus, and they're the ones who fill the gaps, and they know who needs help, how much help they need, what's legitimate, what's not legitimate, and they do a fantastic job. And that's, uh, I, I, and so I say that because the PEI Alliance for Mental Wellbeing, and I was talking with um, Karen Cumberland the other day, and I mentioned this to her as well, it's a very, it's a very rigorous application process. It's good for the larger organizations with the larger projects. Like if you're going for a, uh, like a $300,000 initiative, uh, like Dr. Murray, I was talking to her about um, just the other day at the UPEI convocation about her grand family's initiative. And I don't know if, if many of you are familiar with that, but uh, it's a really important one about grandparents raising grandchildren and grand families is what she calls them. So she applied to the PEI Alliance for Mental Wellbeing and I believe she got around $300,000 and that is just catapulting her her work into the, into the next level. She's doing amazing work and at some point hopefully we can hear from her. Um, but we need to empower these small organizations when it comes to mental uh, health and well-being. And, and right now the application process and the size is, is really geared at the bigger organizations. So I, want, I, I appeal to you uh, and, and as we, we come into this next four year term to, uh, to look at improving that application process, making it more accessible pushing them so that um, it's not a barrier to simple wellness in initiatives. So when I, when I say that, I'm talking about um, peer support groups. It's very simple. Um, Madam Speaker, when I, when I talk to my constituents, there's a couple that, that come to mind that uh, went through serious, serious mental health uh, uh, issues. But what they really wanted is they just wanted a weekly group of people who had gone through the same thing that they could check in with. I think we're all familiar with, uh, with AA. It's the same sort of idea, I think, but, uh, but a, little, a little bit different. But it's a peer support group for people with mental health issues. And you know, this, we need to be able to find a way to provide funding to let those things work. And I think our service organizations would be good centers of support for that. Um, integration back to life after addiction treatment. Now, Lennon Recovery House, of course, is, is in my district. And it's, it's an amazing uh, organization that took a long time to get going. And I want to give Diane Young a lot of credit for her perseverance and her vision to make that happen. Diane has moved on from Lennon Recovery House. She's not actively involved in the day-to-day. -day, but that's not a bad thing. She was the founder. She had the vision. Lennon Recovery House now is, is going to the next operational level. But we need to support, support more of that. And... Um, Integration back into life doesn't have to be a big, complicated thing. It goes along the same long, along the same lines of peer support groups, but providing ways for people after they've gone through mental health and addictions issues to be somewhere where they're not tempted and and constantly pulled back into that same old routine that got them in trouble in the first place. Another area that I advocated for when I was minister, and uh, the minister of uh, social development and seniors, I hope carries on with this. Um, it was the former leader of the third party, uh, Sonny Gallant, who actually, um, you know, helped champion this idea of a seniors navigator. He wanted a seniors advocate originally, but um, that was a little overkill, we thought, so we came to a compromise, seniors navigator. But what I always wanted was I wanted a whole seniors volunteer network so that um, when seniors had an issue, they could go out and they could be connected with someone in their community that could help them. I mean, I go door to door these days helping seniors sign up for Maple so they can renew their prescriptions easily. And I'm sure other MLAs do it as well. But if you had, if you had a seniors volunteer network, we could, easy, we could do that. That's something I want to push for. We've got a, a, just a phenomenal seniors community in North Rustico, for example. And uh, the star of the Sea Seniors Club, as well as the Rustico Bay Seniors Club over in Rustico. And I think uh, there, there's huge, um, 
huge opportunities for that. And really, there are a lot of people who are seniors themselves, younger seniors, that do a ton of work helping older seniors. This is all about wellness, by the way, because a lot of the help they give is just reaching out and talking to those people. So that's a wellness initiative that I think, you know, I understand the speech from the throne can't be too long, but that's something I think was, was maybe missing. Wellness, community gardens. We've had some minor initiatives on those. I think the, uh, the Minister of Agriculture has funded community gardens before. We need to do more of that. That's good for wellness. And there's lots of people out there, again, I'm thinking, I'm thinking seniors, but others, um, going out and gardening and growing something and making your own food is something that helps your mental well-being. Also, um, it helps with the pocketbook. We had questions today about the cost of living and, and food insecurity and uh, the cost of food. And community gardens is a, way to, to small, a, a small way to help that, but there's no reason why we can't support it. It's good for mental wellness, and it's also good for the pocketbook. Um, another thing that we don't talk about enough is the regulation of gambling and VLTs, um, especially in community on online. Now, I'm not saying we have to get rid of it. It's going to always exist. But we need to regulate it better, and we have to make sure the people who are abusing it get the help they need or have the restrictions placed. I mean, I'm, and I'm going to say it, I can say things that I, uh, because I'm a third term MLA, maybe others can't, can't talk about, but when you go into a community organization and they've got a roll of VLTs in the back room, I guarantee you, if you talk to the people who manage that club, they can tell you the 10 people that are blowing their life savings every week going into that, uh, in, on those VLTs. And that's no way to fund a community organization and it's no way to, to, uh, to build communities. So we need to do more with that. Um, and I think it's the, uh, I think it's the Minister of Health again that has that under their portfolio. I think the, it's under the Assistant Deputy Minister of Health responsible for mental wellness, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, the other thing uh, we can have to continue promoting is healthy food. I think that goes hand in hand with community gardens. Um, and we, wellness also is about, oh yeah, on the healthy food side of things, um, I wanted to talk briefly about the school food program. I was very privileged uh, to be the Minister of Education and Lifelong Learning that brought in that uh, school food program. Um, it was actually the Department of Social Development and Housing at the time that really, uh, when schools were shut down during the pandemic, really got it off the ground by delivering meals to people's homes for children that they knew needed the food. Um, but. There's a lot more that can be done and needs to be done with that school food program. Um, if, I, if I'm being honest, I think we need to focus more on accessibility of the food and making sure that the people who need the food get it. And we need to, to worry less about uh, making sure that it's perfectly healthy, you know, and, and those sorts of things, or perfectly locally sourced. We have to make sure, first of all, that the people who need the food uh, get it. And, um, our pay what you can model is an excellent one. I think the operational process by what you put in these, those orders and the way it gets to people, I'm not saying it's extremely bad right now, but it needs some, some improvement. That's the, the healthy food program with school food, yeah. Um, the other thing uh, that I wanted, oh yeah, I wanted to talk about, this is a good spot as any. So the, the Minister of Social Development was questioned today about the, it was a new, really a newspaper article report that came out a couple weeks ago, I think it was, talking about how um, children's food insecurity on PEI, I mean, I think the numbers were it was around 24, 25% back in 2019, now it's around 35, 36%, and it's gone up. But it boggles my mind. I don't understand how food insecurity for children went up when we introduced our school food program on a pay what you can basis. So that tells me there's a problem with children accessing that food. Um, and also we've increased the social assistance rates so much. There's, there's something um, called the Maytree Report and it's gonna come out in November and it's a, it compares the social assistance programs, Madam Speaker, across all of Canada. And Prince Edward Island, with the increases we've given, if it's not number one in every category, I'd be extremely surprised. There's people who want to come to Prince Edward Island. They want to move here. 
because they want the social assistance rates that we offer here because we're so high in Canada. They're, they want, why are you moving to PEI? Well, I want social assistance and you got the best rates in Canada. So I'm wondering if there might, and I'm going to throw this out there, there might be an actual flaw in that report and how they actually categorize what a food insecure home was. And maybe they're not measuring whether the child's getting the food they need, but whether it's a measure of poverty of the home. I don't know. I, I want to know what the, problem, what the problem is. I want to dig into that report a little bit more. It just does not compute. With the amount of money and, and in social assistance and a school food program, I don't understand why that's happening. Even in a poor home, why the children still have food insecurity. I don't understand why. That's what I want to know. And so people who are poor have access to get food. And we need to, of course, that's another issue altogether, addressing the root cause of why people don't have enough money to buy healthy food themselves. But the report was specifically on food insecurity of children. And with the amount of supports that we give, I just don't, I don't understand how the, how the report got where it was. I kind of wish I was the Minister of Social Development today because I would really love to answer that question when that one was brought up, let me tell you. Anyhow, the, uh, the harm, uh, you, I just went over my answer there for about 10 minutes, but that's all right. The, har the harm reduction site is another area of wellness. Um, it's uh, something that's a long time coming, and we got caught up in the federal and the provincial responsibilities and the, the rules and the laws, but I think it's finally around the corner. And it's just what it, what it sounds like. There's a reason why it's not a safe injection site. It's harm reduction, because it's, it's a place where people can go to improve their wellness. Harm reduction is the concept. Yeah. Harm reduction is the overall so when it comes to wellness, we have to focus on harm reduction. We have to focus on that theme. The site where people can go to reduce their harm is just one part of it. But, and, and you know, I, I mean, the, uh, the member from uh, Charlottetown West Royalty has been a big proponent of wellness. I mean, I, I've been elected for four years in him, so I, I was the original proponent of wellness, but you know, he's, he's also jumped on board and that's good to see. But, uh, but, uh, but wellness is, is a key person. And, and that's one reason, now, now that I'm on the back bench, I'm not on executive council, I'm not focused on a portfolio, I want to be an ally of the member from West Royalty to help him in his, his fight to improve wellness, to see more money spent. I, I, just spend, I just talked about a whole bunch of areas. These are just a short list. I'm sure you've got a dozen more. So let's, let's work on that together. Yeah, and speaking of which, uh, Madam Speaker, when, I remember when we were elected in 2015, uh, the leader of the third party and I were interviewed by CBC, and oh my goodness, I, love, I think about the new members here in this chamber and how exciting it is to be a new MLA and how, how much you want to make a difference, you want to make change, and you, and you want to represent well. And I remember just about jumping through the TV screen when we were interviewed about we were going to work in a positive, we were going to do collaborate, and we were going to make change. And, and Madam Speaker, I'm, I'm taking inspiration from the new members in here now to try and get back to that person I was then. Because, you know, you, you take a lot and you, you get the snot beat out of you. And, you, and, you, and you, you know, you can't, sometimes you, you forget to be uh, optimistic and you forget to work and collaborate and be positive. And so that's where I want to get back to. Someday, I might even agree with the Charlottetown Victoria Part MLA on some issues. I don't know. I know that's a little bit up to her. That's a little bit up to her, Madam Speaker. I can only, it, you know, collaboration is a two-way street, you know. You're right. It is. It is. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So I'm hoping that we can collaborate in the future, too. So, Madam Speaker, I wanted to move on here. Um, oh, no. I, um, we can talk about wellness a little bit more, but I think the member from Charlottetown West Royalty uh, has completed his... Uh, response to the speech from the throne? No, I haven't. No, so I think we're going to hear a lot about wellness there, and, and, and so maybe, maybe I'll leave wellness now, yeah. and, and I'll, I'll let him take up where I left off. But, uh, Madam Speaker, I wanted to talk about something that's, uh, in, in my district, uh, after, after health, believe it or not, the second biggest topic was not housing. I hear that all the time. It's always health and housing. Housing was not the biggest topic in my district. I live in a rural district. I live in, I mean, let's say, I think for the most part, a fairly well off district in the center of the island. There's a lot of government employees, people who can travel to Summerside, people who can travel to Charlottetown. Um, the large tourism component, the large fishing and farming component are three major industries. Um, 
So the number two concern in District 18, Rustico Emerald, and this has been consistent since I first ran in 2011, transportation and infrastructure. Our roads, Madam Speaker, are the thing that people want to see, and it's just, it's just gotten more and more um, uh, a topic of concern because, and uh, I know the Minister of uh, Responsible for Population it would know this, where, where are the people going who are coming to Prince Edward Island and moving here? The, we're going to be 200,000 people in, in, in 2030 or so. They're moving out into my area. That's where they're coming to because there's not enough room in Charlottetown and Summerside. And those ones are at capacity. They're coming into the center of the island. They're going east or they're going west. But a lot of them, let's face it, it's a desirable area of the island because you can go to Summerside and go to Charlottetown. You can go both directions. I know the member from Kensington Mallpack has the exact same thing. Um, yeah, Winslow too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, uh, the special planning area makes it a little tough there. Yeah, but I'll let someone else talk about special planning areas. Anyway, um, one thing that's happening is when they move into the area, we've got, you know, roads that have been dirt roads for 50 years. You know, the people that have lived there for 50 years, they said, yeah, for two or three weeks in the spring and for two weeks, three weeks in the fall, either I got a four-wheel drive truck and I get really muddy, or I park my car at the end of the road, I walk in, I take my waste bins and my recycling bins, I pull them out to the end of the road because they won't get picked up otherwise. And that's just the way it is. I've lived here forever. And um, I know the, minister, the former Minister of Transportation, the Minister of Environment, Energy and Climate Action knows this because he had the foresight and the vision to actually put in an initiative to go out and he was bold. He went to social media, he went to Facebook, and he said, what clay roads would you like to see paved? And he got thousands of responses, thousands. Because it's something that needs to happen. It's something that people care about. And this is not mentioned in the speech from the throne. And I don't know if we're trying to cater to people in the urban areas or what, but we need to have a policy on clay roads. Yeah, and the Minister of, of uh, Fisheries, Tourism, Sport and Culture, when he was Minister of Transportation, I had to ask some questions in the House. His name had to go up on lights at Emerald, on the big sign. But we are paving, we are paving the, uh, the Mill Road into Emerald this year. However, I think, I think the Minister may remember when we met with the Chief Engineer and said, so what's our policy on clay roads? What's our policy? You know, do, do we know uh, when clay roads go to gravel, when gravel roads go to pave? He said, our policy is we don't pave clay roads, full stop. We don't really have a policy. We need a policy on how we move clay roads to gravel roads to paved roads. We, the population numbers are going up. People are moving into rural areas. These roads are in, in bad shape. Climate is warming. We have warmer winters. It was a mud bath for most of the winter on the clay roads in my area. People are going crazy. And these are people who are moving from Ontario and British Columbia and Alberta, and they're like, they don't even know what a clay road is. They're like, oh, this is quaint when they move there in the summer. Next thing you know, they're up to their axles in, in mud. And, and, and it's nice to say, oh, didn't you know it was a clay road when you moved here? But that doesn't solve the problem. We need a policy. We can look at the population that lives on the road. We can look at the traffic count. <clears throat> we can. Uh, we can maybe make it part of the land use plan that goes across the province, but Madam Speaker, we need a policy in the Department of Transportation, and, a, and a, I want the, the Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure to know this, of when we start to, to progress a clay road along the continuum. It could even be a heritage road right now. It could be a, it could be a, a, a tractor trail, it could be a cow path, but when do we go from a cow path to a tractor trail, to a heritage road, to a clay road, to a gravel road, to a paved road? We need to make that happen. That's something that has to happen here. Now, the other thing on the transportation infrastructure side um, is, and I think this was clearly outlined in the speech from the throne, but we do continue to need to expand public transportation to serve rural areas year-round. That's something I heard time and time again, especially in the, the uh, I guess, the population centers in my district, like North Russell Cove and, and Hunter River. The people are looking to take the bus. They want to take the bus. The Tooney Transit is a great thing, great government to put that in. We need to keep expanding on that. We need to continue to expand the Active Transportation Fund. Um, 
there's a lot of people who would love to, to bike and, and can bike um, and, and travel and walk and ski uh, year round if the pathways were there. So we have to continue with that. There's a, a number of projects in my in my district that are underway, like the replacement of the uh, North Rustico Boardwalk and then an extension of it out through the North, North Rustico Harbour. Right now, there's no safe way to really get to Gulf Shore Consolidated School from within the village. And I think if that was there, it would be great. And there's opportunities for that. Um, I know there's a lot of people on board, but we have to focus on that. I think that was in the speech from the throne. I think I heard that. Um, and another thing, getting right down to the nitty gritty, is we don't have enough graders in the central part of PEI. Uh, we, 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 got, we got a grader and a half to do all the clay roads in my area. And I hear that the member from Borden Kikora has three in his district. So there's a problem here. There's an imbalance. Minister of Transportation. This is something I wanted to talk to you about anyways, but what we need, we need more graders. We need more graders in my area. Just fork out the money. It's just a budget thing. Get another grader. Get another grader operator. Well, good. Uh, this isn't capital. This, this is operating budget. You can do it right now in the budget. Make sure you put more grader, more grader, more grader, more grader. I, this was my input to the speech from the throne slash budget request. Oh, okay. oh, slash slash no chat GPT. GPT. Yeah. So, and everything I've said today, I generated through chat GPT. No, I'm just, I, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That's not true. I'm going to do that one of these days, though. That's a topic for another day. Um, the other thing that I want to see from tra uh, transportation infrastructure, and I wanted to thank the minister for his announcement yesterday for Fiona, Fiona cleanup. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a huge thing. Um, I'm hoping that the, the program doesn't exclude some people who do need the help, but I know the minister will be flexible to make sure the people who get help, uh, need help get it. Um, one thing that happened during Fiona was there was a lot of people, because they're amazing. The communities are amazing around the island. I mean, I, I like to think my district I, we heard it, the, is one of the best, but they went out and they cleaned up government roads. Uh, Chad Deagle went out and he cleared the Perry Road himself because his house was down there and needed to get out. Um, uh, Alfred Fife went out to the Bumblebee Road and he cleared it off. He made it through. Those are just two examples of many, many. The thing is, they weren't able to go back and get any compensation because they just went out and they, they saw work that needed to be done and they did it. And I don't know what the answer is, but this is a problem across our government programs is if you do the work and then you apply, you can't get any compensation for it. And I can, I can understand, there's a, if you open it up and let people do work and get compensation, then there's, there's room for abuse, right? You don't, you don't know if they, the amount of work they did was actually needed to be done and you want to look at it first and get approval. But if there is a way we could solve that problem or, or improve it, that would be really great. But I want to thank all those who did go out and clear government roads on their own dime, on their own sweat and blood, for their neighbours, for themselves. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to... Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, just on the topic of both active transportation, reduced fuel consumption, and wellness, um, when, when requests come in, and I think it's the Minister of Sport and Culture is probably now responsible for this, when schools, for example, say, hey, we want to buy snowshoes for our intermediate students, then let's get a fund where we can make that happen. That was a request that I put into Sport and Recreation, and it's like, Right now, as far as I know, it's still in the queue, churning away somewhere in the, in deep in the belly of government, right? So, yes, I think it was snowshoes is what they wanted, yeah. But I mean, that's, that's about wellness, right? That's about getting outside. It's about active transportation. It's about a whole bunch of different good things. So, um, I'll get that request into you, but let's just think about that, right? Because a little bit of money can go a long way. The giant initiatives that we can pound the desk and say, wow, we just made a great announcement for $2 billion, whatever, $2 million, those are great, but it's the small ones. Like, the, the member from, uh, from uh, Kensington Ballpark is fantastic. He's fantastic at these small ones. In fact, he helps me out. He, he may or may not live in my district as well, but in his community, for example, down, at, uh, down in Granville, down in South Granville, which is really the member's community as well, they wanted to build a, a rink outside the community center. And it really, we're talking like a few thousand dollars. So he, he took it upon himself, and I want to thank him for that, to talk to the former Minister of Communities, and that was all in the works. 
Um, it didn't actually happen yet, so I'm going to appeal to the new Minister of Communities and possibly the Minister of Sport and Culture to make that happen coming up this summer and winter. But I think they're looking for $5,000 now, not three. But anyways, that's another thing. Um, an outdoor rink in West Rutherford. Outdoor rinks are good. It's, it's about health. It's about wellness. It's about active transportation. It's, it's about so, so many good things. So I'm going to move on now from transportation and infrastructure. Yeah. And, and I, I, I'm trying not to get myself in trouble here too much. <laughs> it's not going very well. <laughs> but I, I, think, I think I'm going to talk about housing, land, and communities next. So, um, well, you know, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait. No, I'm gonna no. wait. I want, I want to make sure that the, the minister's here, and, and perhaps, um, perhaps, uh, not that he's not here right now. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but I want to make sure that he has his full attention to listen to my, my so input on this trouble. subject. That's better. So the, um, so why don't we talk about social development and seniors? Oh, yes. um, so one of the things that uh, I was able to introduce when I was minister, and really not a lot of people even know about it, it, did, it had no fanfare, it wasn't really even announced, nothing, was, yeah, yeah, I know, it was great. <laughs> I, 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 I might, you might say, you might say I was, I was doing good work on the down low, maybe. <laughs> but, um, but, um, in all serious, though, uh, it was a, a targeted basic income guarantee. So maybe you were aware, but we, we had people, we had over 600 people in the province that were, were living in deep poverty. So if you use the market basket measure, which is a basket of goods and services to measure what a person needs to, so they're not in poverty, we had over 600 people that were, were less than 75% of that full basket of market basket measure. And so, um, so I said, I, I like the idea of a basic income if implemented right. I, I like a universal basic income a little better than a basic income guarantee, but we don't want to get into semantics here. But the targeted basic income is a way to say, these are the people who need the help the most, and most often through no fault of their own, they are living in deep poverty. So, I mean, they don't have the medication they need, they don't have the food they need, they don't have the shelter they need. And we're trying to help them along through social assistance, but we've got thresholds, we've got rules, too many rules, that's another thing I'll talk about. However, why don't we just say, if you meet these criteria, like you've been on social assistance for five out of the last six years, you're not getting off social assistance, and you're living in deep poverty, we're gonna bump you up. Originally, it was 85%. I think most of those people are over 100% now, market basket measure. Um, you know, people who have a disability, so they can't work. Like, they, there is, like, literally physically no way that they can pull, pull themselves out of poverty. Why should they be living in poverty? It's our responsibility. That's a good progressive conservative value right there. That's what we do as progressive conservatives. And so I was really glad to bring in the targeted basic income and pull all those people, over 600, out of poverty. And we also included um, uh, children in care who were aging out of the system because what happens is they're in the system, where th whether it's a group home or a foster home, when they come out of the system, literally they turn 18. I think we extended the period now, can be up to 24. But they, they're, they're literally kicked out on the street with nothing. But welfare to throw, fall back on. So this targeted basic income, we wanted to target them. I think it was around 625 people we helped. Market, yeah. My targeted basic income. It was really started, the former Minister of Social Development and Housing, it was called a uh, secure income pilot. And, and I, I changed it and, and, and uh, increased uh, the criteria and made it a targeted basic income. Newfoundland right now is getting all the credit for targeted basic income if you, if you, you go to the FPT meetings, you sit in those circles. But we had it a full year before they did. So, you know, just, just so you know, just so you know. Anyhow. Um, but the current criteria are very strict for that program. And so what we need to do is we need to continue to, to try to open up the criteria and people who are still in poverty, as, as based on that market back as a basket measure, we need to continue to bring them out of poverty. 
Now we can target people that are not just in deep poverty, but maybe they're, they're at 80% of market basket measure. Let's bring them to 100. That's how we're going to solve the problem with food insecurity. Right? That's, may, that's how we're, we're going to, I mean, the member from Charlottetown, Victor, Victoria Park, may or, not, may or may not agree with me, but that's how we can solve the problem of poverty. I mean, we have our Poverty Elimination Strategy Act. That's how we're going to make the targets that are in there. So the other thing I wanted to see on social development and seniors was I wanted to see more focus on um, foster families and associate families, but in particular associate families. Um, it was great to see the Foster Families Association here today. They do an amazing job. Um, the problem with, with foster families is child protection actually has to take a child into the care of the province. And I think the, the Minister of Justice and Public Safety knows exactly what I'm talking about. Before you can place them with a foster family. And once they're in the care of the province, that's where things can really go downhill. What you want to do is, if you can, uh, leave them uh, in the care of, of, of their own family or their loved one. That's what the Grandparents Raising Grandchildren program is all about. Child protection doesn't want to take it in under provincial care. They want custody to remain with the family because they have a much better chance of thriving and being better because families are so important. So I wanted to say um, that on that front, we've got the, we did a review. I'm not sure what happened with the question set. I think it was the member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park, talking about a review of the Child Protection Services Act. Maybe it was in her minister response. But we did, we did a review of the Child Protection Services Act. The former Minister of Social Development and Housing started it. We completed it. And we've got a new uh, Child and Family Services Act ready to go. And it's going to help solve this problem of custody. It's going to allow child protection to take um, a child out of the custody of their parents, put it in the custody of grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, loved ones, and allow them to have the, the legal custody they need. But we need that act to pass before that happens. Um, but associate families are the one that I really wanted to talk about because there's a huge number of people, and both former uh, ministers of social development and housing know this, that are, are, are sitting out there, and Madam Speaker, these, these are people who have been living with their parents for years and years, and their parents have really done an amazing job looking after them and, and uh, really borne, and in many cases, a burden because of it. But back in the late 60s, early 70s, our, our institutions were closed down, and these people who were in the institutions had to go live somewhere, and they went into their families' houses. Now, they're, they're, they're seniors themselves, and, the, and they're... they're their parents are not around anymore to look after them. And where are they going to go? We have hundreds of people like that in the province. And um, associate families are kind of like foster families for adults. In, in a way, is one way you could describe it. Adults with special needs. And, there's a, and there's huge, those huge, needs are huge for caregivers, for adults with special needs. So if we, could, if we could have proper day programs and respite programs, and then have associate families, instead of building group homes, that's where we can go to help solve this problem. I'm convinced of it. And I think we had something in the budget last year, but I want to see, I want to make sure we don't lose focus on that. And, um, and we need to, to really review the amount of funding that they get as associate families. It's, and same with foster families. We've increased a couple of times, but boy, oh boy, yes. with the cost of living going up, we need to increase the amount of money we give people who provide this valuable service and add a significant advantage to government because it's a, such a much lower cost for associate families and foster families to do their work than it is for government to try and do it internally. All right. One thing I wanted to talk about as well um, was expanding the um, Senior Secretariat uh, project funding and scope, um, especially for wellness-related activities. Uh, I think you could easily double the amount of funding that goes there. And a little bit of funding goes a long way. If you look at the list of projects that, that they do, and there are a lot of them are really related to, to mental well-being and helping people out. Um, so we need to do that. And that's a more of a budget request, I guess. But um, the other thing is we need, to, we need to continue to work on and expand the, the senior food program. Um, so we've, we've heard some announcements about it. I think there's a pilot that's taking place in the eastern part of the island, uh, which, which is the Rotary Club 
coupled with the um, uh, Meals on Wheels organization. But I tell you, in North Rustico, they're already doing this on their own. They, they serve it, yeah, and uh, and they and they don't. And I'm not saying we have to give 100% funding to these organizations. This is the this is the part about community organizations that's the best. A little bit of money goes such a long way. They know how to do things efficiently and effectively. And that was something that I've been lobbying for for a long time, but I want to make sure it's not lost. Um, I wanted to highlight like the Stella Maris Church in North Rustico. Through the Knights of Columbus, they run a food bank and a regular meal for seniors. And that food bank. It, I mean, unfortunately, has expanded quite a bit, um, but they do a great job. Um, one thing uh, I think we need to continue to review is um, the income support assured income model with respect to reduction clawback uh, when working to re wor reward those who work. We want to make sure there's absolutely no penalty for going out and earning money yourself. Um, because I, I, I think we're just shooting ourselves in the foot if we do that. It's a, it's a tricky one, don't get me wrong. Um, I think we need to continue, continue to improve accessibility and promote this as a, a priority. I, I heard that time and time again. I, I can't remember who was talking about it. Maybe it was the member from West Royalty about uh, Beach Grove Home. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just all we have to do is widen the doorway so the wheelchairs can get through. Like, this was something, when I was minister, I said time and time again, it was very frustrating for me. I said, it's great that we have budget and capital budget for fixing the roofs and fixing the extra systems. We need to do that. But I want uh, uh, a relatively small portion of budget allocated every year to help with forward-facing issues. So this is like painting the foyer of a senior's home. You know, going in and replacing the floor. floor replacing the floor, these sorts of things, right? Anyway, um, we need to continue with that and set aside, really, because those are the things that make a difference to people. And they may not be, what, someone going in may not perceive them as major issues, but when you see them day and day again, they just make a huge difference. Now, we need to continue with the, um, and the Minister of Social Development may know this, but there's a, there's a, currently an initiative on the way to review all of the policies within social development, uh, update them, and hopefully simplify them. We need to keep doing that. That was not mentioned specifically in the uh, speech from the phone, but like that. And um, we also, and th this was this was a, uh, an idea that's really, I think the member from Charlottetown Victoria Park actually likes to champion this one, and it's something I agree with wholeheartedly, and that's. Um, um, social enterprise for those with barriers to empo employment. It's, 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 it's long overdue. I mean, I was told, okay, we're going to get the outreach center in, 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 in place first, and then we're going to do social enterprise. Yeah. But, you know, we need to make some progress on that. And, and there's a, this is a way for people to help themselves. That's why it's so important. So now is the hour. And it doesn't have to be at the outreach center either. I just use that example. It could be anywhere. We already have, like, the REACH organization that's doing that sort of thing, right, and others. Um, also, I have down here, it's, it's something we need to continue to do. Uh, the Minister of Social Development and, and Seniors has to continue to review the thresholds that we have for our programs. They, they, they're not where they need to be. We have to look at inflation and we have to make sure they match. Typically, we're like a year behind or something like that. That's one reason we see poverty. And I don't know how we make we do that faster. It was something I requested, but I don't know. Here I am. Anyway, now we go to, um, I wanted to move on to agriculture. <laughs> I don't have a long list in agriculture. I got to say, the uh, Minister of Agriculture has done a, a really fantastic job over the last four years. And um, what I do have on my list are, are more things like uh, make sure that the supports are awarded for Hurricane Fiona that the farmers have applied for. I'm sure his phone rings off the hook all the time on that. There's a lot of applications in, but they, they need to the help now. Get those payments rolling out. Um, I think, and this, this goes right in with the public safety, you know, the create and plan and implement measures, uh, create a plan and implement measures to mitigate and respond to future extreme weather events. So I know that'd be on your radar. I mean, you don't want to have a, a giant rainfall coming and washing out a crop, for example, or, you know, the extreme, the drought, 
uh, events. You know, you might, we've already made great strides on irrigation strategy. Um, I think there's probably more work to be done there as well. It's pretty good. There's soil health. Yeah, it's, is it soil health, not just irrigation? I guess soil health. But when I say, yeah, okay. Um, and then uh, the other one, which was a very specific request in my district, was expand three-phase power uh, access to agricultural operations. And I think the minister uh, responsible for energy, it's the McKenna uh, farm that was, where they grow the, uh, it's the carrots and turnips. They have, uh, they have, you know, cooling, uh, I guess really what they are is heat pumps at the end of the day, but they're really inefficient right now in two-phase. Uh, they could get more efficient units, use less electricity if they had three-phase power. Um, it's, uh, I would have to get back to you in terms of the distance from the three-phase three power, but I think, it's, I think it's very feasible. These are the sort of guys that aren't going to ask for the world there. Anyhow, so we'll do that. But uh, in general, um, um, I, have, I, I have some great farmers in the district, um, in particular a lot of dairy farms, but uh, I also have some really amazing people who are working to help farmers, like Stephanie Arnold, who does a lot of research on, uh, on how climate change is going to impact uh, potatoes, for example. It's in the net zero plan. So, so those are all things. I think I've seen some references to that in the speech from the throne, but I wanted to highlight that. Um, what the heck, since we're, we're in that portfolio, I want to talk about justice, public safety, and the Attorney General requests. Uh, and I think this is happening, but we need to ensure enough emergency shelters are designated and they are adequately resourced to provide supports during emergencies. Um, Hurricane Fiona emergency shelters were run mainly by volunteers and supports were not consistent across emergency shelters. Uh, some areas had organizations like fire departments, New Glasgow Fire Department. They just stepped up even though they weren't officially designated. I think there was, you know, this, there was some confusion where, uh, you know, in a municipality, they said they felt like they had to do it all themselves. You know, so you had volunteers making food in their kitchens and bringing it down. And when in fact, if they would have asked the province they could have been open 24 by 7 with all the food provided and enough funding. So, so please work with the Minister of Communities and, and make sure that they know that government is there for them and there's all kinds of money to access to make that happen. So, yeah. All right. Status of women. Here's one. I got a request for the status of women. I, I, it's really about, um, it's about discrimination. And, uh, and in diversity, it's not particular to status women. I thought that'd be the good portfolio, but um, apparently, and this is from someone who actually ran driving schools for many, many years in a different jurisdiction. Um, there's there's clear discrimination in driving tests against immigrant dri immigrant drivers, uh, people of color, for example, uh, but people in generally who are not from the island. So it's something to investigate and just check into. Um, I'm not sure the exact method you would do that, but if something was brought up and I said I'd report it. But uh, continue to make strides for equality and, uh, and judge based on, um, on fair objectivity and not on uh, discrimination based on uh, any particular um, other feature. Uh, fisheries, tourism, sport and culture. One of the things I hear time and time again is allow seven day hunting on PEI. And so, I'm hoping that legislation could come forward for that because I'm totally in favor of that. I wanted to bring it forward when I was Minister of Environment. I was told it was not the right time. So hopefully the right time is coming. Seven day hunting. Um, uh, I think uh, we need some help to rebuild, repair and improve the harbor infrastructure. Stanley Bridge, of course, was devastated in Hurricane Fiona. North Rustico as well. I've been able to, uh, to meet with the, the Minister of Fisheries, the new minister, and his deputy. I think we're on track for that, but I wanted to get that in there. We also need to um, increase the tourism budget to better represent the tax amounts that are collected from, from tourists. Like when you, when you think about it, tourism plays a huge, huge role in the revenue generation in our province. The Minister of Finance would know that. Like tourism, huge, huge revenue generator. But the amount of money that we actually we spend on that is, is, is not really 
consistent. I think we, we, there's room to increase and improve that. And I think our tourism operators feel sometimes a little hard done, done by. So I wanted to lobby for that. Um, economic development, innovation, and trade, I don't have a, a long list. In fact, the big one, and I think this is where it, where it resided before, and everybody in this house experiences it almost every day, is when you're driving and you're talking on your cell phone and the cell phone reception drops. I know the, men, the members from the West who are driving here, I'm sure they get most of their work done in their drive soon from work. They're from the East as well. So I don't know what minister it is. I got it under Economic Development, Innovation and Trade, but please, I wish that was like front and center in the speech from the throne here, was make sure we close the gaps in cell phone coverage It'd be so, so, so good. Everybody get excited about that in, in Cabinet and please make that happen. Acadian and Francophone Affairs. Uh, C'est un uh, petit uh, list d'items here. Je, je parle un petit, uh, petit peu français, mais we need to work to make Rustico a gateway hub for Acadian tourism. And I've, I've already mentioned this to the Minister, but uh, we can really engage a large volume of tourists and we can redirect them to other Acadian uh, sites like Evangeline. And we, want to, we need to develop the Farmers Bank of Rustico. We need to help them get an executive director of these sorts of things. It's, there's a huge opportunity here to improve our, uh, our Acadian tourism in the province. And, uh, and I've talked to the Minister of Education about this, but also let's work together to get a new bilingual library on the North Shore. I think there's, there's the first steps have been taken, but I'll continue to work with that. Um, workforce advanced learning and population. I have a few points here. Um, one thing is uh, we need to continue to improve the learning paths from Holland College to UPEI. And I, in fact, I'll go a step further from our, po from our secondary education to our post-secondary, in particular to Holland College and then to UPEI. I think that was in the speech from the throne. It was definitely in the election platform talking about learning paths. But uh, it's, it's a huge one. So um, right now, there's people who, they might become an RCW and then say, hey, I want to become an LPN, and then say, I want to become an RN, but our system does not support them making those transitions very well at all for it. That's just one example. I think you could look at early childhood educators as another one. There's been some really good improvements there. That'd be one to look at as an example of how to do things possibly. Um, here's, here's a really interesting one. So everyone's familiar with the Career Connect program? And this, this is the, Madam Speaker, you're familiar with the Career Connect program. So this, this allows students who accumulate, not in their first year of post-secondary, but afterwards, if they accumulate the right number of hours, they can qualify for EI when they go back to school. So I had a student uh, bring this up to me. Um, and, and may I should preface to say, if you, if you, if you go around, in particular the retail outlets, I'm thinking like fast food chains and, you know, small stores and things. You'll notice that it used to be you'd see a lot of, of island students who are working in those jobs. But now what we see is, is a lot of, of new islanders or even, even in some cases uh, uh, foreign workers and permanent residents who are working in those jobs. And what this, this is the reason brought up to me is they said when students qualify for the Career Connect, they no longer have to work part-time jobs when they're in school. In fact, I don't think, I think they, they have severe limits on the amount of hours they're allowed to work, even if they chose to, because of the EI program. So, this, and this was a student who actually brought this up to me on a campaign trail, who has used the program. She said, she thinks it should almost even be a requirement of the program that you work a small number of hours of work. And I, we, have a, we have a huge problem with our workforce, right? And we have all these students who are collecting EI to go to school, and they could probably afford five to 10 hours a week, you know? To, and, and I mean, the student's gonna hate me for saying that probably, but I think it's a one way we could improve our workforce, and this was brought up on the campaign trail by a very smart university student, business grad. So the other thing is uh, we need to continue to work to expand our co-op work programs. There's some good co-op work programs. Um, there's a little bit of red tape involved with them. I think we can streamline the process. We can get more students into the workforce more often. 
Uh, we need to work, and this is something I've heard time and time again, and it's been discussed, but align the school year with the in industry needs, like uh, especially the hospitality programs, right? And I see some, some folks around the room nodding their heads. Like if you're, you're a hospitality student, right, and um, you know, your school year doesn't line up with the tourism season, then the tourism operators really suffer, and you suffer as well because you don't get the work experience you need. Potato harvest is another great example, right, of where we can align uh, school years with, with uh, industry needs. Um, and we, one thing that's worked very well, I know, in the early childhood educator section, and I'll, I'll give the, the current Minister of Education a lot of credit. It was, it was something that started in my time as Minister of Education, but um, is study while work programs. So this means while you're working, for example, in uh, early years at a daycare, maybe, maybe you're, uh, you don't have any qualifications, you can actually study and start getting your early childhood educator credentials while you're working. And there's no reason why we couldn't do that in a number of, of areas. So I, I, I go to the Minister of Workforce and say, look at some study, to, study well work options, because I think there's some opportunities there. So uh, Madam Speaker, um, I'm going to continue to save housing, land, and communities for another day. But um, I, I wanted to. Uh, I think I'm going to. I'm going to start on environment, energy, and climate action right now. So one of the big things, and and uh, the former member from uh, from Summerside, uh, Wilmot, uh, he started off down this path. I think um, perhaps he was. Uh, Met, met a political opponent that uh, maybe he uh, wasn't up to the task of uh, meeting, but he, he tried to bring some private, a private member to, to the floor to, to look, about, uh, look at um, allowing net metering across multiple properties, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, Madam Speaker, I think uh, I'd like to adjourn debate as uh, we've reached uh, the time of next year. Seconded by the uh, member by, from Surrey, Meyer. I will remember from Kensington, Malpeck. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Motion 28 to the floor for debate. Bill Carey. Here. The Honourable Member from Borden, King Cora, moved, seconded by the Honourable Member from Summerside, Wilmot, the following motion. Whereas the School Resource Officers Program is a collaborative partnership between schools and law enforcement, and whereas the program is currently available in school families in Charlottetown, Summerside, communities with municipal law enforcement agency, and whereas currently this program is not available in any school facilities not served by a municipal law enforcement agency, and whereas there is interest in seeing the school resource officer program extended to other parts of the province, therefore be it resolved that this assembly encourage the government to explore the feasibility of expanding the school resource officer program to families of schools in rural Prince Edward Island. Honourable Member from Borden, Kinkora. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, motion number 28 with the senior the school resource officer is a very important motion. And I think it's something that affects the whole island and all our communities right across the island from one tip to tip. I have to say, I think our, our school, off, school resource officers initiative has been in place for several years and has been a success at the schools that has been implemented in. But I don't think we've gone far enough. I need, think we need to expand it and bring, our, bring more education to our students on what services are available across the island above and beyond the school resource officer. I can tell you, Madam Speaker, as a former police officer, I'm a strong value, I'm a strong believer in community-based policing. Back in 1984, I started policing uh, in Woodstock, New Brunswick, and I carried that on into uh, the province of Nova Scotia, and then ended up here in the, in the province of Prince Edward Island. And I think we've moved away from community-based policing. I think that's one of the problems in society today. I think it's one of the problems we're seeing across the country, and especially down in the United States. I must say that community-based policing is simple. Community-based policing, and, and uh, uh, our Associate Sergeant Barnes here, she can attest to it, it's not rocket science. 
Community-based policing is simply making sure that the students and our businesses and our community leaders, our residents, our constituents, who's traveling through know who we are and that they can call the police at any time, day or night, and we're going to come help. I can remember back an old police officer, his name was Jim Malcolm, and he, 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 he told me back, I hate to date myself, but we're going back 30-some years, he, um, he said, all the street today is a new day. And, and I still have no gray hairs, right? Um, but he, old, old Jim always said, he said, uh, treat today as a, I'd like to uh, stop, stop debate just for a second and acknowledge something here. I'd like to acknowledge that we have the deputy speaker now sitting in the chair. Congratulations to the honorable member. And uh, you look quite prestige up there, I'll have to say that. So. But uh, old, 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 old Jim, uh, he went and made, he made a statement, he said, treat every day as a, as a new day. And it's something I've always thought about. And uh, it doesn't matter if you have a good day or a bad day today. It doesn't matter if you deal with somebody in the worst light possible or in the worst possible situation or it could be the best situation. Tomorrow, if you have to deal with that individual, treat him as if it's a new day. And it's something I, 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 I constantly run through my mind and I think about it. Um, if, if you and I have a problem today, don't take it forward tomorrow. And it's, 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 it's something I, I strongly believe in. Police officers need to build bridges. Police officers, whether it be a social worker, a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, the guy at the corner grocery store, doesn't matter what job they're in, Madam Speaker, Mr. Speaker, they, they, uh, you need to build relationships and you need to have the trust in people and the respect of people to get the job done and help them when they need help. I strongly believe in relationships. I've said it over and over again. I, I, I think it's so important to never underestimate the power of a relationship that you can build. And that starts in our school system. It starts when teachers, and we have excellent teachers and, and student guidance counselors, um, when they build their relationships with the students. And some students, they build their relationships with other students, of course, but they build relationships and foster relationships with the people within the school system. And that is so important because it's going to shape the life as they go, their life as they go forward. Student resource officers, they have a they can they can develop an understanding and a bond within the student body and they can see which students need help or might need a little bit of guidance um, I've been very fortunate over over a number of years I can read people I can tell when they're having good days and bad days um, I did take some courses in 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 that type of, of work and how to how to watch for it and detect it and a kind word goes a long ways when a person is having a bad day or the ability to see an individual and have a chat with them and say hello and, and you, catch on the, you, catch on the, you catch up on something that, you know, maybe that individual is not having the best day of his life. And I think our guidance counselors and our students' resource officers can pick up on that. And it's so important that, you know, that child or that student going to school he might be sitting there and he might be very quiet and he might very not be very outgoing, but there might be something that he's trying to deal with. And having these resource officers available in our schools so that they can pick up on that and find out what's going and help that student going forward, forward is very much. I know that the Minister of Education, she cares very deeply about our students and our school system. Um, I have saw that. I've watched it. Um, and I think that's something that uh, as a character that she should be very proud of. Um, and that's something that uh, we all need to watch for is, is to be there for our students and help them and give them student resource officers tools they need to foster relationships and be open as they communicate across the school system and out into the real world. Mr. Speaker, the, stu the school resource, it's a little bit of a tongue twister there, the school resource officer program 
uh, also complements the good work that's being done in our schools by the student well-being teams to support our students and families. And the student well-being be, build, the student well-being teams build on what the school resource officer program started, initiated, and has carried on. And I think it's something that we need to build on. For several years now, the school resource officers have been in, in place in several schools in communities across Prince Edward Island. And we need to take it to the next level. Charlottetown Rural, Colonel Gray, and Three Oaks High School have all had these school resource officer programs in place, and they have been a success. And we need to take what has been learned from them and expand it. These programs are a positive, and they do, they do provide a benefit to not only the school, but outside the school and within the family life and within the community as a whole. Right now, though, there are many school families of schools across the island that don't have the opportunity to participate in the school resource officer programs. Kinkora and Kensington and Bluefield all happen to be in Malpec. Montague, Morell, Surrey, Evangeline and West Isle, we need to expand these programs within to them schools. I believe that. I think we all should support that. And I think we all should make that happen as we move forward. All these families of schools don't have any school resource officers in place, which could benefit the school and the students. And I'm going to add the family. In the family of schools where we do have school resource officers, these areas have local municipal law enforcement agencies. I've noticed over the years, we've gotten away from community-based policing. And it doesn't matter what agency you talk about, whether it be municipal, RCMP, provincial police departments, and other areas, we've gotten away from community-based policing. It's not rocket science. A police officer drives down the road. He goes into a grocery store. He takes a walk through. He has a conversation with who's in there. He stops at the bank, goes in and says hello to the teller. He stops by the school, walks the hallways, pops in and sees how the receptionist is. Them type of activities are so important, and I will slam the police departments for it because we've gotten away from it, and we need to get back onto it. It's something I enjoyed very much when I worked in them, in them three different provinces was taking the time and the five minutes to stop by and have a conversation with somebody, or somebody would be out raking their lawn and stop by and have a conversation, or the kids would be in the basketball court and you would take your gun belt off and you'd put it in the trunk and you'd go play basketball. Or you might throw a couple of balls. Or there was a bunch of people, the kids could be hanging around the park bench and they just could be talking. And the police officer, I used to do it, and the other guys used to do it, guys in Summerside used to all the time, Kensington, St. Elmer's. They would, they, would, they would take the time to stop by the park bench or that, that little park and have a, have a conversation at the picnic table with the students. It was regular practice. I still do it today. I still try once every two or three months to take a walk through Inglewood School, Somerset, Amherst Cove, and Borden, King Cora Regional High School. I enjoy going to these schools. I enjoy stopping by. I, I appreciate that they know my name. And I enjoy and appreciate when they, they take a moment and they come up to you and they have a conversation. And I've had that with me. I've had, I actively give them my cell phone number. And I've had conversations or calls from students or private messages, and they wanted to have a chat. And they, they wanted to, they, they might be having a little bit of a bad day, or, or they might have a question about something, and, and, and they reach out and they ask you. And I think that's so, that's what we're here for. And that's what we, we should strive for every day to be accessible to not only our constituents, but especially our students. I got a request the other day out of the, out of the blue from a school. They, uh, they asked, they invited me into school, I'd be coming up the next month or so. Um, they invited me if I'd stop in and talk about a couple of different topics and stuff like that. And it doesn't matter what's going on that day, if they give me the time and date, I'll clear the schedule and make sure I'm there for them that day. And I think that's very important. The um, school resource officers, I think 
they've been such a success and it has created interest in other families and schools across Prince Edward Island. And I think that as a government, we can expand that. These families of schools are located in both rural and urban communities, serviced by both the RCMP and local law enforcement agencies, be it Kensington or Summerside or Charlottetown. I think this is an issue of fairness for all island students to have a chance to benefit from participating in the school resource officer program. I think that, I think that there are students and staff and families in the Surrey family of schools that would benefit from taking part in the school resource program also. And I think it's actually been brought forward and a suggestion has been made. I believe and think that there are students and staff and families in the Morell family of students that would benefit from taking part in the school resource officer program. I actually heard that one day when I was down there. I remember a couple of years ago, uh, I was down met with the Morell Fire Department. And uh, I remember them, them, them talking about how they would like to do more um, stopping into the school and stuff and, 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 and showing what the fire department does and how, could they, how they benefit the community. And the school resource officer program could be expanded. It, it, it doesn't all have to be about police officers coming to the school. It could be about our fire departments coming from the school. It could be about our conservation officers coming to the school. It could be about mental health people coming to school. It could be a variety of, of different occupations across government that could pop in and be available to them. You like that idea? I think that's, I, 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 I think it could be expanded so much. It could be Tim Garrity walking in and talking about elections. And I, the minister and I were working on that program back last year and we had that discussion about the importance of knowing what the municipal government structure is and, and, and encouraging our youth to get involved at an early age in different nonprofit groups or organizations that are out there. And it could be organizations coming in and explaining what they do and how they benefit the community. I think that these students and staff, also in the Bluefield family and schools, they could benefit from this program. West Isle. I know the minister is very passionate about the West Isle area and up, up west, the same with the uh, member from uh, Inverness and also uh, from Tignish, Tignish Palmer Road. No area across the island should be excluded from having the ability to experience what a resource officer program could bring and give to them. Evangeline Schools. The honorable member over there, the minister. We can't forget our French friends. We must make sure that they are part of every community or everything that we, uh, we offer to them. And we do, but we need to expand it. Our First Nations. We need to also engage and, and include our First Nations people. I think that the students and staff in the Kensington family that also could benefit this. And of course, last but not least, King Cora. King Cora High School. It's a great high school. It's one that uh, uh, they're quite a crew out there. And uh, they definitely keep me hopping some days with questions and uh, activities and things are going on. But I know that school could benefit from a resource officer and that program. Mr. Speaker, this is an area where we can make a good difference to all islanders. As I said before, it's a program that not only helps the school and the students, but it also helps the community and the family. Mr. Speaker, with that, I will pass the torch to the honorable member and let him carry out debate. Thank you. Honorable member from Summerside, Wilmoth. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just went through all my notes and crossed out Madam everywhere I had it, so I won't call you wrong. She's been getting it for the last three days. I don't think we need to give it to you as well. So you're on your toes. Mr. Here. Speaker, I rise today to happily second the motion 28 on school resource officers. Let me begin by saying that I'm a big booster of the idea behind the school resource officer program. 
The member from Borden Kinkora mentioned Three Oaks Senior High School and having a resource officer. Being active in the community through coaching minor sport and with the fire department, I run into a lot of these students that are in the school. And let me just tell you that it's all positive from the students having the resource officer there. Uh, the resource officer himself, I knew a couple of them that were in there, real good young fellow that I spoke to, and he told us of different conversations that he had with the kids, and just, he said it was a pleasure to be there. Now also, good on the City of Summerside Police Department for picking the resource officer that they had in there. Uh, he looked like one of the kids. He was a young man, clean cut, and the kids related to him, went to him. It was a great setup, and it got it started, and it rolled on, and they still have a resource officer in there. I think these programs are very helpful to our youth, and they bolster other programs and services for our youth. With all the things that the youth deal with today, it only makes sense that we try and do things to provide as much support as possible. When you think about what the kids have to go through, with cyberbullying and everything else that's going on in the schools, it just, it absolutely makes your head spin. Like I can think back, when I went through high school, there was no such thing as cyberbullying. We didn't have the cell phones to do it and whatnot. So I can just imagine, I have a young daughter of my own that goes through school and I hear some of the stories and I'm very pleased to know that when she moves out of her intermediate school and goes to Three Oaks, there is a school resource officer there. Uh, the honorable member also made reference to uh, taking his gun belt off and playing basketball with the kids when he was a officer and that's what our school resource officers were doing at Three Oaks. They engaged with the kids. They didn't just sit there or sit in an office. They engaged with the kids and I'm sure that every other school that has them, it's what they're going to do. I can't speak for the other schools where they're at, but I know that the one at Three Oaks not just the one that I was speaking to, but the other ones, they all engage with the kids and they're an active part of their life. Mr. Speaker, uh, Summerside Council was able to work with the schools and with the provinces to establish that resource officer there and it has been a positive change in the lives of these kids each and every day. I feel that the positive move is still paying off for students as they come out. When they're done at school, they have that interaction that they have with the resource officer, and it just makes them that much more comfortable speaking with different law enforcement agencies when they have to do that. Uh, I heard very good feedback from the officers who took part, and it helped them do their jobs better. It put them back in touch with the youth, and they're able to hear and see what was going on from the ground up with the youth. Like, they knew which ones they had to deal with and talk to and figure out what was going on. Uh, one resource officer that was at Three Oaks, he told me it's great because we know where all the prom parties are, we know where everything's going on, we know where we got to be. Oh, so now I've got to change my notes back to Madam Speaker. <laughs> ah, here we go. Well, Madam Speaker, I apologize in advance if I call you Mr. Speaker because I just changed all my notes to Mr. Speaker. So. Keeping on your toes, member. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I've heard very good feedback from the students who felt that the relationship developed the positive effects as well. I also heard feedback from the teachers who saw the benefits of this program and raved about it. So when my colleague, the Honourable Member from Borden Kinkor approached me about this motion, I was happy to support it because I think that the other schools should have the chance to take part in the school resource officer program. It don't matter what grades they house or how many grades they house, we should be able to help this at every level. I was glad that the idea of expanding the school resource officer program to the other schools was included in our party platform during the last election. This will be something that could make a big difference for students, teachers, and communities all across Prince Edward Island. That is why I am putting my support behind this motion with the honorable member and I hope that all the rest of the assembly will be able to support this motion as well. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Honorable Member from uh, Charlottetown West Realty. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, it's a pleasure to rise and, uh, and follow up those um, 
um, good speak speeches and talk about this uh, important issue. And I guess we're talking about school resource officers. And um, I'm the education critic. I'm also a bunch of other critics too. <laughs> so this affects a lot of what we're talking about um, every day in school. So I mean, our, our children have faced a lot. When you look at what they went through after through COVID and coming out after COVID, it takes a while to socially interact with their own communities and with themselves in school. It's, it's tough for some kids and some kids get left behind. I was, I was excited to see uh, some cyberbullying men mentioned in the speech from the throne. Um, that's, that's very, very important because we're hearing it. We're hearing it. And if you look at cyberbullying, if you look at those type of things, that's where the, the real issues are um, moving forward with the kids. It can be done. Uh, it's not done face to face so much. It's done. It's done online. It's done in computers. It's done with phones. We can't see that. And our, our resource officers need to be there to build the relationships, to make it comfortable enough to be able to talk to them about the issues. And that's not always easy. And if we're saying, and if you're if you're saying that this is important enough for Prince Edward Island across the board, it, it is. But what I don't understand is that this motion's coming forward from the Conservatives, that it's coming forward, but at the same time I'm reading an article on December 2nd, 2022, that states that we had to eliminate the program because of funding. It's, 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 it's here, it's the, in Charlottetown, an article from the CBC talked about not enough staff continued school resource officer programs to the Charlottetown Police. Yeah, it, it does. Well, it doesn't matter what it is. We're 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 in this provincial legislation. You said conservatives. No, I said if the if the if the conservatives are bringing forward a motion like this. Don't expect the truth from the liberals. You can say what you want. That this that this happened under your watch. This was taken away, and you had the opportunity. You had the opportunity to fund it. Former Minister of Justice or Minister of Justice, you still are. You had the opportunity to step in. <laughs> Red yeah, four red current. You you had the opportunity to do something about it, and now the motion's coming up and an important one. But we've lost this resource because it was it, there was there was not enough funding in this. So, and you know, in this article, it says it it really came down to staffing issues and a lack of resources. So it's not funny anymore because you're the province of Prince Edward Island. We, we take care of their education. We have the opportunity to make this different. We have the opportunity to do something about it. So this is a really timely motion. And I must say, I must, uh, I must compliment uh, the member from Borden Kinkora to, uh, to bring in this forward. And you know, this, the, the, there's an opportunity to go back to them because in this, in this, uh, and they said, is this the best use of policing resources? Limiting policing resources puts police officers in schools, or are there other professionals like social workers and such that can, can funding could be used for? Interesting. That's that's very interesting. So this is the the the, the police officer talking about this. And what he said in the article is, he, we need to talk more about it. We need to bring this up and talk more, but we need to ask that question. Who is the best person for those resources? Is it police? Is, do, we, do we want that? And if so, we need to have that conversation. Or can we do something? We have itinerant teachers, teachers that travel around in the school based on need. Okay? Did, have we talked about that? We're doing itinerant kind of programs in rural Prince Edward Island where we can build that relationship with not only teachers but social workers or different people or police officers. Maybe they rotate. Maybe that's a, maybe that's a program that we start to look at. But I, have a, I, have a, I want these police officers back. And you know, what's, you know what? You, have, uh, you had a, a former candidate that did a, a darn good job of this. Um, Tim Kaiser did a great job of this, and and um, and and Christy did as well. So um, she was she she was in this position too, and she did a great job when she was there. Um, we need to go back to this, and what I'm what I'm not understanding is that this this was it's not there anymore. So 
this motion, uh, and I will, I will support this motion, but I would also scold the government at this time for letting this happen, for not stepping in and providing the funding if it's that important. We talk about cyberbullying, we talk about uh, what we need, we talk about rural communities. This is a tough time after, after COVID and we need to continue to invest in these and build the relationship with, with the kids and former, uh, with, the, with the person in this uh, the school resource officer. And I'll talk to you about another thing too, is that we have an issue with diversity in Prince Edward Island and we have to make sure that the kids who are diverse understand that police officers at a young age are there to help them. We have to make sure that that's there. So if the Colonel Grays and the Shaw Term or the, the communities that are diversifying bet between all kinds of different things, you need to be able to do that. And I'm telling you, this is a serious thing with, with, within the BIPOC community. There is the, the relationships are, 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 are coming along, but they're very difficult. When you look at an issue like Black Lives Matter that happened, that took a while. That took a while to, to, to rekindle and look and build trust within the communities. So that's another thing that I, I'd like to talk to the assembly about, about it not being there. We need to educate and make sure that people understand that police officers Okay, and people who are in armed forces are there for everybody. And that relationship has to start somewhere and it needs to be done. And I've, I've spoken to the police force on three or four different occasions. I've gone in to talk to the, to the, to the force there about this. I've talked to kids about this. this. This is a serious thing. And the minister, I'll give you a compliment now. We're doing better with the Holland College program. Okay, we've talked about that. We're trying to educate, we're trying to get more people onto the, uh, from the BIPOC community onto that force, but we still, have a, we, we still have a ways to go. We still have a ways to go. You have, you have, you have three or four? Three or four. See, that, that's, that's, a, that's a compliment um, that I'm gonna give you to, that, that it's programs like this, it's discussions like this, it's what the police force have talked about. They want to have more discussions on it, so um, that's why we're bringing this up now because there are a lot of issues, especially in the high school level, that we don't see and we're not seeing and trust and education and being there with the right people could fix that. Mm -hmm. So um, let's, the budget's coming down and make sure the, the minister can go back and talk to the, the police force. I know it's municipal and I mean, I know it's, I know there's some municipal things, but they might need funding. It's education. It's education. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's, it's your budget, and, and I want to make sure that those conversations are being had. Did we stop this service, this important service, because of funding, and you're the provincial government, and you have a chance now to put it, to put it back in? Okay, so um, that's kind of uh, um, summarizing, summarizing the importance of this, and whether it's wellness teams, funding, community-based policing, diversity I've talked about, um, but we need to work together and, and, and make sure that that, that resource is there because this, be, this could be a very important motion and not just passing it, but we have to do the work around it to make sure it happens in rural Prince Edward Island and the, and the right people are there and it happens right, right across the province because this could be a very important thing. So I'd like to thank you for the, my time and uh, I'll uh, see the floor. Honorable Member from Charlottetown, Victoria Park. I guess I rise to speak to this, not sure what to do. Um, I feel I don't have enough information to say whether this is the right program to go with or not. I don't know if we've evaluated what that program looks like in PEI. I only know what has been happening in other jurisdictions with, with this program. And I agree with the member from Borden Kinkora. Relationships are everything no matter how old you are, no matter where you are in life, and in particular when you are in school. Relationships with adults um, is really important as you kind of learn to make your way through this world. And so I guess it, it leaves me, I, I have a couple of questions and I, I know I can't get answers to and then and some comments to make, but one of the questions that, that I ask myself, so I guess let me back up here. I'm gonna explain why the, the, the stuff that I've read makes me take pause with this, and that is reading various reports coming out of London, Ontario, 
Toronto, Ontario, Edmonton, Peel Regional Police just recently pulled it because students were feeling unsafe in their school. It didn't make them feel safer. It wasn't having the intended consequences. Um, they found in some places that they were ending up identifying offenders. And so it, school became, it was having the unintended consequence of this is that students who were in school and the goal of this program is to make them feel safer, it was actually making them feel unsafe. And it brought to mind a program that the Women's Network with uh, community legal information put on in schools for grade seven students. And it was a sexting presentation. And they wanted a lawyer to come in because part of the context of that is that they wanted to explain to students where their legal rights were in there and what legal obligations they had. And so they needed a lawyer to come in. And in choosing a lawyer, they made it very, very clear that this lawyer was to come in in plain clothing because it puts you, it, there's such a power imbalance when you have, whether it be an officer or someone in a suit, if we were to go into a school right now, we would, there would be a power imbalance right there just based on, on the clothing that you wear. And if you are in a marginalized group, if you live with domestic violence, if you have a relationship with police officers that is, that is not positive, if you come from a country where um, police officers are not your friend, then we've got some problems here and as our island diversifies, I think that this becomes even more important for us to consider. Um, so I guess kind of, you know, what the goal, what the goal with this is, and some of the stats that, that I found were that these, um, sorry, resource officers, school-based resource officers, um, are 5.5 5 times more likely to impact Indigenous students in a negative way. 3.4 times more likely to impact students with disabilities in a negative way, and 3.3 times more likely to impact, impact black students in a negative way. And so <clears throat> I myself, in, in kind of making my way through this program, because I agree, um, Tim Kaiser, it's funny, years ago, every time I would see that man, I remember one time I was driving on the bypass on my way back from Cornwall, and they were doing some sort of stuff, like, traffic stop and I stopped and rolled down my window just to thank him for his work because um, at that time I thought this program was really amazing and something to build those positive relationships with law enforcement. I think that that's really important. That's why I'm struggling with this. It's just that is school the proper place to do that? And you know, I don't agree that a special resource officer and a school counselor can, they don't have the same roles. They don't have the same skills. It's not their job to have the same roles and the same skills. So we can't, when we were at the, I wasn't at the education debate, but I watched it. And, and having a lot of teacher friends and families, you know, I've never once heard anyone mention that program to say we need more. All I've heard is like, we need more counselors, we need more resources in the school, we need more teachers, we need more EAs, we need more hands on with the kids. And so I struggle because I do. I think when you're, you know, when you see commercials on TV or you're watching something and you see a police officer hop out of the car to play basketball with kids, I think that's really beautiful. And so I, I do, it's not that I don't think that, you know, that I don't think this is a bad program. I just don't have enough information and based on what I'm reading, I'm not sure it's the best way to spend resources. Um, and the last point that I'll make is that, you know, I can't remember which member, it might have been the member from uh, Restico Emerald, is that what, Rest who talked about street safety. And, um, you know, when we consider Prince County has some of the most dangerous driving, reckless driving, you know, I think about the fact that we are, the police, the police departments do have a shortage of staff and so how how that affects them and how that affects the safety of the rest of the island and so I guess I it's not that I oppose this motion I just don't have enough information and based on what I'm reading I just don't feel like I can support this motion because a I don't have enough information and the information I do have suggests this isn't the best use of resources so thank you for bringing it forward and uh, I look forward to hearing what others have to say. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Education, Early Years, and Minister Responsible for the Status of Women. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And uh, of course, anytime I have an opportunity to stand and talk about our schools and um, supporting our students, I will gladly do so. I want to thank the Honourable Member from Borden-Kinkora for 
bringing forward this motion. I know we've had uh, discussions regarding our school resources officers in the past, and so I really do appreciate you bringing this forward. And, and the seconder, Charlottetown West Royalty student had some facts mi mixed up, but that's neither here nor there. So I do appreciate his, his comments, um, but certainly it lack, did lack some facts. So anyway. Um, the public schools branch and La Commission Scolaire de la Langue Française, they operate 62 school, public schools across the province, offering kindergarten to, to grade 12, as many of you know. Anytime there is an opportunity to further support um, our students and our staff, it's absolutely worth considering. Typically, a school resource officer is a sworn law enforcement officer responsible for safety and crime prevention in schools. They are employed by a local police or law enforcement agency and work closely with school administrators in an effort to create a safer environment for both students and our staff. In Prince Edward Island, our municipal law enforcement agencies in Charlottetown and Summerside have at times invested in school resource officers. They have seen the need in their communities and feel their students would benefit from the SROs um, stationed within their schools. And I know there was a few names brought up here today between Tim and Christy. All have done tremendous work, so um, thank you to those individuals. As the Department of Education early years, we have worked very diligently to provide SROs with space and collaborative opportunities within our schools. They provide a great service for our students, for our staff, and we are grateful for the work that they do. However, Madam, Ms. Yeah, Madam Speaker, I had done the same as uh, the Honorable Member from Summerside Wilmot, and I'd crossed out all my madams, but here you are, you're back, which is great to see. Um, it's important to note that uh, SROs are not the only law enforcement supporting our schools. Our high schools in our rural communities have at least one liaison law enforcement officer assigned to them. So these liaison officers, while they aren't in our schools full time, they do provide regular check-ins, they meet with administrators, they provide presentations to students and collaborate with the schools on projects or issues that arise. For example, Montague High School currently has two Kings District RCMP officers assigned to their school. They come into the school to do their presentations and lockdown drills with staff and students. They respond to traffic issues and regularly patrol the area around the school. They also respond to issues that the school administration would bring to their attention. We are very fortunate here in Prince Edward Island to have exceptional RCMP and municipal police officers across the province. As an education system, we certainly believe in collaboration and will continue to work with our SROs currently in our schools and the RCMP and liaison officers throughout the province. I do support this motion. I think we need to do some further investigation and, and dive deeper into the issue, but um, at its surface, I do support it, Madam Speaker, and anything, again, to keep our school communities safe, I'm in support of, and again, appreciate the Honourable Member bringing it forward. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honourable Minister of Agriculture, Justice, Public Safety, Attorney General, and Deputy Premier. Thank you, Matt, Madam Speaker, and uh, I want to thank the member for bringing this motion forward, the members, and uh, everyone that has spoken on it so far. Um, Within our department, we've had great working relationships with our municipalities, our municipal forces, police forces, and the RCMP. And uh, I'm proud to say we regularly meet with these groups and we have a really good working uh, relationship with them. And uh, when we have this conversation uh, about uh, resource officers in high schools, it's, it's a great, it's a great initiative, it's a great idea, and it's worked well in the city schools. Um, where it gets a little more complicated, I mean, we've heard from city councilors, or city representatives, MLAs, here in the house. Um, I would like to hear from our West Prince colleagues who don't have municipal work, uh, police forces that rely on RCMP. Um, to put an RCMP officer in a high school, I think it's how many high schools? Seven high schools across this island in rural PEI. You know, you have to look at that cost. But that's something we definitely need to look at. And uh, I'll definitely lis listen to the debate, listen to the Department of Agriculture, or Department of Education, sorry, and the principals across this island on a solution that perhaps we can come up with uh, uh, a solution for this. 
But I also believed this is focused on our, not only our safety of our children, but our safety of our communities. But when we talk about safety and our communities, it's also about well-being. And we have put student well-being teams in all our schools. I don't know how many exactly people we have, but it comes out of my budget, the student well-being teams. And, uh, but when, you, when that program was set up by the previous, previous government, the, the Liberal government, it was to take a, a well-being approach to, uh, to high schools and the resources that kids need. It's not only a uniformed officer that you need, but you need that connection one-on-one -on -one with the, the child that will open up to one of the student well-being teams that can also go to their house, go to their home, that can, uh, it's more of a wraparound service. So I do like the idea of a resource officer, but I don't want to forget the importance of our student well-being teams. And maybe we can grow our student well-being teams to have a resource officer that floats around the island, that, but not necessarily a full-time officer in, in a high school. And I do, when you look at uh, Chief McConnell's uh, reasoning in that article, the city police, Charlottetown City Police, he questioned whether this was the best use of his officers. So it is a, it is a discussion that uh, we have to have and I'm willing to have, and uh, I look forward to continued debate on this, and, uh, and I'll gladly meet with any MLA, any principal, any the minister and her department to see if we can come up with some solutions. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I remember from Russ Tyler. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. It's a pleasure to rise to speak this motion. Uh, when I was uh, Minister of, of Education, way back when, there was this, uh, this councillor from the city of Summerside that used to call me, oh, four or five, six times a year. And the main reason of the call was we need to keep our school resource officer at Three Oaks High School, and the provincial government needs to pay for it. It's not, this is not a, a municipal responsibility. Now, Madam Speaker, this, this, this councillor may be actually sitting in this chamber now, his Minister of Social Development. And now, um, I, w I must say that uh, we, what we, we did then is we always found the money somewhere to make it happen. And that's why there is a school resource officer at Three Oaks. And the, um, the principal was always highly in favor of this. They really liked having them there. I mean, we heard from uh, the other member from Summerside here, and you can, you can tell very strongly in favor of a school resource officer. Now, when I was Minister of Education, what we're hearing from the current Minister of Education, Minister of, of Justice, those were the kind of conversations that were being had. You know. What about the student well-being teams? Shouldn't this be someone on the student well-being teams? Can we just, uh, you know, take the, uh, the youth worker that's from the Department of Justice on the student well-being team, and maybe if they wear a uniform, maybe that'll be the same thing having police officers, this sort of stuff. Or, you know, what is it that's the difference between that youth worker and a police officer? And then, as the Minister of, of Justice said, uh, he was Minister of Justice at the time. That would be, it would be a, a similar conversation. You know, is this, this is what the RCMP superintendent is saying. This is what the, the chiefs of police are saying is the best use of our resources. So it's a, it's a tough one, but I think when it comes to this, you gotta, you gotta look not at the budget and not at, at senior management. What you gotta do is look at what's happening on the front line where it's needed and you need to put people where the front line is requesting it. That's why when I knew that the counselors were in favor of it and the school principals were in favor of it, I said, yeah, this is something that, that makes sense. Now, that said, this motion is specifically about span, expanding into rural areas. I think the Minister of Justice just talked about, uh, or sorry, the Minister of Education just talked about how there already are liaison officers that work with those schools. And if it truly is about creating that relationship between police and students, it, it, it's, it's, it is, it is a, a tougher decision. I know, um, you know, perhaps a, a, a Charlottetown rural or a Colonel Gray or a Three Oaks might be a, le a little easier decision than a, a small high school like Kinkora, where, you know, or, or, or even Bluefield for that matter, which is a much larger high school. Anyway, um, at the end of the day, I think 
you have to look at the people on the ground. So these are the teachers and the school administration. And you, uh, you need to ask them whether they think that's something they need in their school. And that's really what should drive it. Thank you. Speaker. Honorable Minister of Fisheries, Tourism, Sport, and Culture. Uh, thank you, Madam. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I wanted to rise to speak to this motion briefly because it is something that I've been pleading for for probably two to three years now at Montague High School. And um, I just wanted to speak to the member from Charlottetown Victoria Park raised um, some good points and I was kind of just Googling it. And I think Googling it there as we were, everyone was debating the motion I found, I think I found a CTV story that you might have been speaking to where you have a bunch. And, but I know at Montague, um, the, the principal and the staff have been begging for a full-time resource officer um, to actually be in the school. Um, and something that we had worked out in Montague was uh, a retired member, uh, he's retired now, Doug Baker. And he used to be in the school full-time actually when he was placed on, I think, desk duty for, for uh, um, some issues that he was having. But he was in the school, but he was, he wasn't, he was in plain clothes. He didn't carry a gun or, or anything like that. He didn't have a, he didn't have a marked vehicle with him. And uh, it worked excellent for the students and the teachers. They said that just now with all the complexities in the school and bullying and um, they said that the students would actually go to, uh, to Doug with their concerns and he would be able to sort out a lot of the issues between students. Sometimes it was maybe a student committed theft on the weekend at a party or something and, and he, they, he would be able to deal with it before it went to the courts. So it did, it, he kept it, a lot of kids um, out of the court system or perhaps having to go to actually um, you know, I don't want to say being arrested, but they had to, he, he was able to solve a lot of issues before they percolated up. Um, so I do understand what the member is saying and perhaps um, part of it would be that you're in plain clothes or, or a number of different things. But I know in Monica it's something that they do want. Um, and I hope that if uh, there is ever some good news to come and in a budget down the road that um, it's something that we can roll out as quickly as possible because in Montague I know behind the scenes I've been been asking for it and um, they would love to see it um, I think obviously Doug's the issue with the man, uh, an RCMP officer is that they can't find enough of them so to take one out and put it into a uh, school is going to be difficult so there would have to be a work around there and the idea with Doug Baker was that he's retired he, he would do it for a much smaller fee because once you hire a Mountie, you gotta, they need a car, they need the pension, they need, right, the, which increased the cost significantly. Um, so I'm sure there's probably some different options that we could look at, but I just wanted to get up and uh, voice my opinion on just coming from Montague and, and what we'd like to do. And um, I know that in Charlottetown, I think the project started seven, maybe 10 years ago now, I think. And uh, the former government never, never uh, funded any of that. I don't think. No, no, they didn't. But, anyways. <laughs> That's right. But yeah, they just. Yeah. You don't need to put an officer in them when you just close them. But yeah. But it's a very, very important uh, topic. I think there's healthy debate to be had on it, as a member from Charlottetown Victoria Park brought up some good points as well. Um, but I just wanted to bring it from Montague's perspective that they desperately want this, and the sooner the better. So thank you, Madam Speaker. The Honorable Minister of uh, Social Development and Seniors. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. And this is really dear to my heart. The, the uh, resource officer in the schools. I've been, since 2019, when I got elected in Summerside as a counselor, I, that was my first um, 
chore for the city. And uh, I did get a hold of Brad, and then I got a hold of every minister every year after that. Because every year I had to fight. It was, we were never guaranteed that the officer was coming back the next year. So I would spend months on, on the phone with the, with the provincial government. And you always came through with a little bit of help. Thank you for that. And, um, but now we're on our own down there. And um, they're, they're doing it through the municipality, which is wonderful. So we have the officer in place full time. Right now it's a female. She's absolutely wonderful. She has great relationship with, um, with the students and with the teachers. Students feel safe with her in the school. Teachers feel safe with her in the school. They build great relationships all the way around. Um, she keeps an eye on the parking lot at lunchtime when kids are leaving and they've got five people in their car and they're supposed to have one. <laughs> There's all sorts of things. Summerside Police Services could be called up to three or four times a day to go to Three Oaks High School. Well, they don't get the calls anymore, so it really eliminated that. Um, one of the things we decided this year was that the officer go to all levels of schools, so elementary, um, SI, like intermediate, high schools, so that way they're all getting a piece of that um, wonderful um, contribution that she's making to the city of Summerside. So I think that's important too. So when you talk about rural communities, doesn't mean that that officer would only have to stay in the high school. If there's an elementary school there, then or you know an intermediate school that they could uh, benefit there as well. So I would certainly um, uh, agree with that motion and um, think it's very, very important and very proud of Summerside and what, what's happening at Three Oaks High School right now. Thank you. I've exhausted my list, so I'll bring it back to the mover of the motion. To close debate. Speaker, um, I just want to touch on a few points here. I think one thing we have to remember: this is not downtown Toronto, it's not Ontario. The things that happen up there, we shouldn't always try to compare to the province of Prince Edward Island. I think that the province of Prince Edward Island is a very special place. We have the ability here, Madam Speaker, to try things where other jurisdictions never are able to try. It's as simple as that. And we should embrace that. And we should give the students every resource that they need to prepare themselves for life. And I will say that, that uh, what's one thing I've always thought about this house and the, the, the members in this house before and the present, I don't know too many about the present ones, but the before, we've always been there when our students or our seniors need something, we do band together, and we do put the resources available to get the job done. I like the idea of maybe, uh, I have some Texas here, maybe a rotation. Maybe we try this in rural PEI on a rotation basis. We have, a, we, 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 we have an RCMP member that maybe that can rotate through different school, schools periodically across our, our, across our island to introduce to it and try and see how it can be expanded and how it's embraced by the community. We've heard from the Honorable Member, the Minister of Fisheries, um, that Montague wants this. I know King Cora wants this. I know that I've heard from people in Bluefield. They want this and think it's a valuable resource. So why let's, let's ask government, accept this motion, approve the motion, and let's ask government to take this forward try to come up with some kind of plan and program between the Department of Education and the, and the and Department of Justice and Public Safety that can be rolled out across all Prince Edward Island and all our school systems to make sure that our students have a resource officers available in some aspect. It's all about the students. It's all about making sure that they have the supports necessary to prepare themselves for life and to build a stronger community, to build stronger families, to have well-being across our whole system. With that, Mr. Uh, Madam Speaker, I will end debate and ask uh, for a vote on the motion. Thank you, Honorable Member. Uh, <clears throat> the question has been called. All those in favor, say yay. 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 All those opposed? Nay. Nay. The motion passed. Honorable Member. Thank you, um, Madam Speaker. Honorable Member of Kensington, Mulpick, sorry. Thank you, Madam Speaker. 
Um, we would like to call motion 31 to the floor for debate. Chuck Carey. Carey. Motion 31. The member for Tyne Valley Sherbrooke moves, seconded by the member for Rustico Emerald, the following motion. Whereas our primary industries of agriculture, fisheries, and aquaculture have been an integral part of the way of life for generations of many islanders and continues to be the economic lifeblood of many communities across Prince Edward Island. And whereas our primary industries of agriculture, fisheries, and aquaculture significantly, significantly contribute to our island economy through the direct and indirect employment of thousands of islanders. And whereas our primary industries of agriculture, fisheries, and aquaculture also contribute to the environmental well-being of the province through sustainable practices. And whereas these industries have weathered significant external challenges in recent years, including global pandemics, natural disasters, climate change, and international trade disputes. And whereas islanders and island communities have stepped up and stood alongside our primary producers through adverse adversity. Therefore, be it resolved that the Legislative Assembly of Prince Edward Island commend the commitment, dedication, and production of our island primary producers in the valuable industries of agriculture, fisheries, and aquaculture. Yeah, remember, remember from Tyne Valley Sherbrooke? Call the hour. The hour has been called. I remember from Kensington Malpec. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move, second by the member from Borden King Cora that this house adjourn until Friday, May 19th at 10 a.m. Shall it carry? Carry.